Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another thrill-packed episode of the Jim Cornette Experience. Today, it's the if only wrestling was as entertaining as all the backstage drama between the promotions episode. And joining me in bemoaning this fact, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you, he's the Rona Barrett to my Tom Snyder, the great Brian Last, everybody. I don't know if I like that one so much, but aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again. A big Tom Snyder fan, of course, but I could do without Rona Barrett, who, by the way, they used her at WrestleMania once. Yes, they did, as the roving backstage reporter, since she had all the scoops. And by the way, for the people keeping track, so we opened Laugh-In with, or we opened Laugh-In. Yeah, we, we opened, opened the Laugh-In yeah. with Laugh-In references. I'll drink And to now that. we're going to the ill-fated teaming of Rona Barrett and Tom Snyder in 1980. They, you know, Tom Snyder stuck to his principles because he did a smart show. He did a late night show. He did a conversational show. He did a show for for thinking people that were up late at night. That's right. And they wanted to dumb it down and put in celebrity gossip and blah, blah, blah. And when they made Rona Barrett the co-host, he promptly shit all over her on the air like, like he should have. It was classic. Who was the last late night host you actually really were a big fan of? John Stewart. Really? Oh, interesting. When he quit the Daily Show, I quit watching the Daily Show. I couldn't. I couldn't. I couldn't do it. And actually, he's pretty. Trevor Noah is pretty good. It's a different style altogether, but he's no, pretty good. I want to see John Stewart take the piss out of these assholes in that sardonic way. Uh, which is probably why I'm attracted to Bill Maher, not in that type of way, but as a fan of his work, because he's such a smart ass because they deserve it. And I I don't know who all the Jimmies and the and the oh, the new sad. Johnnies are. There's uh, multiple Jimmies. There are no Jimmies. Johnnies. There are no Johnnies. It no is a Johnny. sad state. Now it's just, hey, we're gonna have fun and play games with celebrities. Watch us, Lady Night, and have fun. And it sucks. Last great one, not counting Letterman, because, you know, he's he's like Johnny. He was the Johnny for this era. Yes. But Craig Ferguson produced the best, the most original, the funniest, the smartest, the most thoughtful late night show in a generation. It was brilliant. And unfortunately, he decided to, I think when he didn't get the spot replacing Letterman, that's, I mean, I don't know if that ties in directly, but that's when he decided to leave the show. And they replaced him with this fucking clown driving around in his car with J-Lo or whatever the fuck. Who the fuck, <laughs> what? Who fucking wants to see that? I didn't even know they were showing it. Exactly. Late night has become a real sad uh a You know who else place. we need? We need more of. We need more of Dick Cavett. You know what? If, if most of the people in this country got more dick late at night, they'd be smarter and happier. Dick Cavett was an incredible conversationalist and an incisive interviewer. We should all get a little dick late at night these days. Did you ever see the appearance when Norman Mailer was just being completely belligerent and he was going at it with Gore Vidal and <laughs> Dick Cavett's in the middle and it just gets really awkward. Finally, Norman Mailer turns and goes, why don't you just read the next question on your card? <laughs> and Dick Cavett, who was like, whatever, five foot six, very skinny, says, why don't you fold it five ways and put it where the moon don't shine? What other <laughs> late night host would have delivered a line like that? You remember he once uh, Groucho Marx made a snide comment. I'm t I can't even remember the setup, so it's not going to be as funny as it could be. But Groucho was wearing one of those knit golfing hats with the 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 balls dangling off the thing. It, it, yeah, it, yeah, I know the, I know distant, the hat. distant cousin of a court jester hat. <laughs> And uh, Groucho made some snide remark about something Cavett had said to one of the female guests or whatever. Why don't you pay me some attention? Because Groucho, you have three balls. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> how do we get on the late night? Oh, we I like it. I like talking about this stuff. This is fun. Well, <laughs> we've got wrestling to talk about. Oh, so we're no. going to dip that fun in the bud real quick. By the way, do you need some rain up there? Can we send you some rain? Are you short? We have gotten a ton of rain. Uh, by the way, real quick here at the top, let me just say thank you to everyone who has... Actually, I was surprised how many people uh, got in touch just to see if we were okay with the weather in the Northeast the last day or so. We are thankfully okay. And also, 
there were so many got overwhelming and I didn't respond and I feel bad, but I want to say to everyone, I saw the many tweets and whoever actually knows how to private message me, the private messages about uh, thanking us on, or con thanking us, congratulating us on the birth of our son. And I really do appreciate it. I'm sorry I have not replied to everyone, but I have read them and I appreciate it. How many thanks did you get? Oh, thank you, Brian, for having that baby. Oh, my God. More than gosh. you think. <laughs> Actually, uh, yeah. There were probably some medical professionals that were glad it was over with and somebody at least at <laughs> one person in your home. But, uh, you know, I, I was not concerned about you at all in the inclement weather. I didn't I didn't give you a one single thought. Because well, I, I'm a survivor. I know how to survive things. No, no, fuck. Like you're a, like you're a contestant on Naked and Afraid. I survived in storm Sandy. In Bolivia. Super storm Superstorm Sandy. I Superstorm Sammy Sammy. Superstorm huh? Sandy, which at one point was a hurricane, I ignored the mandatory evacuation. I stayed on a barrier island, Long Beach, off Long Island. Long Beach is off Long Island. It's a whole island of its own. The bay met the ocean right where I was living. Flooding well, everywhere, cars destroyed. It was like I am legend. It was like the Omega Man for weeks, and I survived. I stayed there, and I documented everything with wonderful photography that's now on sale. But we'll talk about that at a later time. Is it really on sale? Uh, you know what? I've been asked to, and I haven't. Some of my photography's been on a couple album covers, but none of it's actually ever been sold. But well, some of, we'll it, some of it has has been stolen and and passed around on the black market, but none of fit, no official sales. So, but I'm a survivor. That was the point. The point of but it the was, point the point was, but in this case, the point was you and your your whole white suburban family was in your white suburban home there last man. Hey. I knew. I know you have a generator. I know you're you're miles and miles inland. I know you're you're surrounded with the most modern conveniences that could be possible to be had and you can't be knocked off the power grid. So I wasn't too concerned about you. I want to remind you the other half of this white suburban family is a very proud Colombian who knows her way around with a knife. So I don't well, know hey. what you say over there. All right, well, <laughs> he's honorary. That's okay. Once, once you move I'm sure to the she'll suburbs, see that as a compliment. <laughs> once you move to the suburbs in Jersey, you're honorarily white. Uh, but... <laughs> Hey, don't make fun of me. I'm I'm thrown off today. I'm cranky. This has happened again. It happened before last year during the midst of the one of the first waves of this multi-wave pandemic. But there's, for whatever reason now, a shortage of Sprite Zero in cans here in my area. And uh, when I bought up all the Sprite Zero in 20-ounce bottles and went back to get more, they didn't have any of those. So I'm now, I'm living like a savage, Brian. I'm drinking two liters. Well, you're pouring it out of the two liter and, into a cup, right? Yes, but no, but see, I'm sipping out of that cup right now, and it's fucking horrible, because here's the thing. If you got a can, then it's proportioned correctly, and by the time you drink the last of it, it's still fairly cold, because you've kind of gauged your, your fucking zabada there. But if you pour it out of the two liter, you got to put some ice on it. Well, then it, it melts, and it waters everything down. Well, then if you're just drinking a, an entire cup poured out of a two liter then it gets warm down at the bottom it gets sticky and it doesn't have the same ambiance as coming out from in the middle of that cool aluminum so it's it's thrown my whole goddamn mojo off i'm, I'm oh god ah. no one needs to hear that See? oh this <laughs> oh stop it hold on now i can't i'm choking myself don't die to... hey come on <laughs> can't do this on the air Jim is on mute right now while he gathers his breath and swallows his drink and tries to make sure he can survive for the rest of this program. But at this time, I want to remind you, if you choke on soda, call the law offices of Stephen P. New at 888-692-8084. Get even with Stephen and say, fuck you, Pepsi. I'm coming for you. You got lots of money. It went down the wrong way. All right. God damn it. You hate vulgar noises. I hate them right into the microphone. It's the most unappealing thing. And I don't think anyone out there who's listening on headphones or in their car or on a stereo or God forbid around other people want to hear those noises. Did you have a big brother? No, I am the big brother. Okay. If you had him, he would have farted in your face when you were a little kid. You know, I would, I would have. Because you're the type of person that would, my cousin did that to me because he was bigger and stronger. I'm not surprised. And I cured him of it. When I puked on his fucking face. 
and the couch. And my mother, no, here's the thing. He, he real quick, I was about seven and he was like 16 or whatever. My cousin Richard, he grabbed me by the hair real quick, leg scissored me because he knew he had to fart and wanted to fart my face. So when he did, oh, and then he let me go. It was so repulsive. I don't know what he'd been eating that day. And he oh. had to have had Aunt Lola's sausage gravy for breakfast. I oh. sat up and threw up all over him, all over his face, <laughs> chest, and it got all over the couch. And, and he he jumped up right in the bathroom. But we, my mother, heard some commotion and came down the stairs and said, "What's going on?" And she said, "What happened?" I, said, I threw up. And she said, "Why'd you throw up?" Good. Richard tooted in my face. <laughs> and then she looked at all the vomit all over the couch. She's like, Richard, damn it. Don't toot in his face anymore. Quit that. Yeah, that never happened to me. And I don't think well, it would have if I had an older brother or not. Well, we'll find out. Um, <laughs> you've still got how time. Will, how, how will we find out exactly? <laughs> <laughs> Parents could adopt <laughs> anything's possible. Uh, all right, all righty. Uh, the time has come, ladies and gentlemen. The moment you have all been waiting for the arrival. We're recording this program before this happens, so I'm all sweetness and light, rainbows and waterfalls and lollipops. Uh, right now. But by the time you hear this, the all-new JimCornette.com website will be on the air or whatever it's on, on the internet. Um, don't giggle. It's that's a fact. It's, I like you saying it's on the air. I like that actually. Well, it's on it's being it's being disseminated out there amongst the interwebs to the various people around the world. JimCornette.com. It's it's it just just shiny and as as Tracy Smothers would say, uh, just as pretty as a brand new Dodge truck with mud flaps, uh, or pretty as a speckled pup. But anyway, um, as we mentioned, uh, links to everything we do. Shortcut if you're confused about how to get to the podcast, we still have that happening. People saying, "How do I listen to this?" Just go to jimcornett.com, click on the podcasts button, and it takes you right to where you can find both shows. Uh, the YouTube channel, the Patreon, uh, my Cameo profile, all these various things, including the all-new and uh, uh, brilliantly functioning Cornets Collectibles website store where you can purchase, finally, for almost the first time this year, except for that two weeks when I got blown up, uh, official Jim Cornet merchandise, everything from Cult of Cornet membership certificates and autograph pictures, to the action figures, the DVDs, the books, the behind-the-curtain graphic novel. Uh, did I mention everybody's favorite T-shirts and all that stuff? And, Brian, I know, um, for one thing, everybody's wanting to know, well, is, is with the new website, have you jacked the prices up? I must admit to it. Yes! A, hold on. I must admit to raising the price of a couple of items. No longer will the certificates and autograph pictures be thirteen dollars each. Now they're fifteen dollars each. I have I've mulled that over long and hard and came to that decision. Where else are you gonna find anybody selling these autograph pictures for fifteen dollars each? And as far as uh uh I want to tell you right now, while we love all the cult of cornet members around the world outside the confines of the contiguous United States and the two outliers namely canada and the rest of the world international shipping charges are ridiculous these days <clears throat> and the one thing that i had not done with the old website was update the shipping in a while right so i found it when i went to get the new shipping rates to send things internationally for via the united states postal service I found out I, every time I sent somebody to the United Kingdom or anywhere else in the world a copy of Tuesday Night at the Gardens, I was losing like $7. Because these rates have got... So I apologize to the international customers. It's not that we don't love you. But 
The international shipping charges are ridiculous these days, so I will give you a tip. If you're going to get something, get two or three things at the same time. Even pool together with your friends. Put it on because... the black market. No, hey, God damn it! Now, hold on here a second. Don't go to the black market. Go to my market. But because you will pay less per item in shipping if you spread it out over three or four items and we put a cap on it so it doesn't get too ridiculous. But um, uh, we urge everybody to uh, to group these purchases together if you're overseas. And as I mentioned, we're going to keep the store open for the first week. And I believe, judging from last time, the action figures should go quickly. We're going to be testing our inventory feature on that. And once those are gone, things should slow down. So if I stop down after a week and fill those orders, then I should have time to jump back on for some holiday sales, but let's not take any chances. I've streamlined a few of the products and I've streamlined the fulfillment process. And I have no vehicles in my garage because it's full of shipping supplies. So I'm ready to go. We're going to do this as quick as we can. But just in case, if you want something for Christmas, buy it <laughs> the first week of September. Just don't be left out. And otherwise, just jump on jimcornett.com and take it for a free spin. That's right. Stay on the air with jimcornett.com. We should do some kind of broadcast marathon like they used to do in the old days. That could be fun. Um, where it, for the if, first like, few hours. Well, they did a Dick Van Dyke show where like a flashback to his previous career when he was on the radio in Danville, Illinois or whatever, before he got the job working for Alan Brady. And he did a radio marathon for charity or whatever. He's supposed to be on for 48 hours. And it was like, he was delusional at the end and <laughs> have fallen face first in bowls of soup and things. That's probably what would end up with it. about after about what? Four hours. We'd do that. Well, Jim, before we get too much further with the show, we should probably let the listeners know, because I know a lot have been curious. A lot of them have been curious, to put it in English, about the schedule and what's going on and when the next show is dropping. Well, it, obviously, uh, everybody is wondering, uh, since it's holiday weekend coming up, Labor Day, when nobody works, right? Um, what we're going to do is this show will be, this experience that you're now listening to comes out on Saturday night, and then Sunday's the big all out, all in, all for nothing, whatever that's called. Uh, we're going to review that recording on Monday, immediately following that program, and the drive through will be out Tuesday as normal with the pay-per-view review, and if anything happens on Friday night on Dynamite, there's a song begging to be written there, Friday night on Dynamite, or on, uh, shit, it's Rampage. Well, then there's no song to be written. <laughs> yeah, if no anything song. happens Friday night on Rampage as well as the pay-per-view, and potentially anything on SmackDown that I forgot to watch last week. We're going to have that plus questions plus songs uh, on the drive through And then next week's experience will be as normal. We'll record it on Friday. It'll come out on Saturday. There's no big events that are changing our schedule next week. So that's the, so that's where we are, right? Right, TGBL? I believe that is correct, yes. All righty, I guess we ought to do the show now. Um, and uh, first thing is, we've got to mention, which everybody in the business did uh, has over the past couple of days, uh, Daphne uh, passed away a couple of days ago. She committed suicide, which was, unfortunately, uh, attention was called to it uh, all over the internet. She put up some videos that scared everybody, and by the time they could find her, apparently it was too late. And, you know, I mean, what do you say about a variety of these things? How How is it that, you know, that somebody can get in that position and, and they can't get any help? Uh, whether it's uh, – everybody talks about the United States has the best health care in the country – well, they do, or in the world, rather. They do. It's just almost impossible to get any of it sometimes. Uh, but anyway, we, we can talk about that in a minute. But the uh, point is, I hadn't seen or talked to Daphne probably in 10 years. I think maybe if she was at a convention 
um, you know, several years ago, but uh, I did spend some time with her when we were in TNA. A nice girl and dedicated and worked her gimmick and liked wrestling and was was not bad. Was was uh, certainly, um, especially with the field at the time, she was one of the more over knockouts that they had. Um, but I guess, and this was after I had left, because I was asking you, I said, what the hell, when I started reading some of the injuries that she had, and, and we had heard, I guess years ago, I'd heard from somebody who had been talking about the case. I can't remember who it was, so I'm not going to mention any names, because I don't remember them. But she had been hurt twice in a fairly quick succession in TNA with concussions involved in both cases. And they said she was going to, and this has been all over the internet the past couple of days. They said, I remember it now uh, as I was refreshed on it. They said they were going to pay for her medical bills and then they didn't pay for her medical bills. And then they, the company actually asked her to wait. She was getting done with all these notices and past due and all this stuff. And they asked her to wait uh, until it was really past due. And then they could negotiate a lesser amount for the settlement. And just all kinds of shit. So they jacked her around, and and I'm not sure what she's had done in the business since then, but I know she'd made appearances, but I think that was her last, you know, regular spot, it probably stemming from, as we've heard from those injuries. But it just, I mean, this girl's like 125 pounds, and supposedly had they had abyss choke slam her off the apron of the ring through a table covered in barbed wire and then were shocked and amazed when she actually got hurt so for everybody who's mad at me because i'm not a fan of you know girls or guys doing stuff like that and i believe from what i remember and i wasn't really following it closely at the time but she didn't want to do it she was kind of talked into it and that's an important lesson too if you really feel you, Which, you shouldn't do something, don't let someone talk you into it. I mean, and I know everybody wants the job and they don't want to get heat and blah, blah, blah. But at some point, you know, if, if you, if you can't see in wrestling, if you can't see something in your head, if you can't visualize, I'm going to be involved in this, do this, cooperate with this, and I don't see how it's going to end well, don't do it. But anyway, so. As I said, I hadn't seen her in years, but then I, Stacy heard about it yesterday, and she was upset. And I said, "Well, what? You haven't seen this girl in years?" And she said, "No, she had just been talking to her on the internet, like maybe a month ago, because I don't know who's all on Facebook and Instagram and all these things." But so she was, you know, really upset by it, and you know, with all the other stuff that's going on, this this should be something that's needless. It's already bad enough when, when people go, you know, and, and there's no, there's no choice and there's no option, but for stuff like this to happen is, you know, is, is ridiculous. And there ought to be, and then here's the, and I've mentioned this before with the WWE wellness program where they offered rehab to people on drugs, but if you got cancer, well, you know, you're on your own. Well, now that this has happened, even though Daphne was not a WWE talent, but she was in WCW in the Attitude Era for quite some time, they announced that they're going to offer any of their, uh, well, I guess any talent. I don't know how they phrased it. Maybe it's just any talent. I think it may just be anyone who's there, actually. Yeah, any, yeah. anybody. Um, you know, counseling, suicide prevention, whatever the case, for free. But why, why does a major company, and it's great, I'm not knocking him for doing that. And other people are saying, well, Ring of Honor ought to do that, and, and, and TNA ought to do that, and AEW ought to do why do these companies have to offer people in their line of work that may not have even worked for them services like this when the United States government doesn't? That's the thing. I'm not talking about, and you've got a suicide prevention hotline number. We're going to give that in a second. But 
would it be an idea if it was easier for people to get help before they're sitting there thinking about doing something and decide they want to call an 800 number at three o'clock in the morning? And that's, it's with all health care. We've talked about the hoops that Stace had to jump through to get surgery on her back. We've talked about the amount of money that we have to pay for insurance uh, if we don't get provided by our employer, which millions and millions of people don't. The, then the insurance that you get, then you have to find doctors that take that particular insurance. And they have to be in a certain clique or network or group or whatever. And then some of it offers mental health counseling and some of it doesn't. And some of it, some of it, you know, well, if you get hurt on a Tuesday, no, we don't cover whatever the case. Most American citizens are not well-versed enough, in some cases smart enough, it's, it's like learning calculus, to figure out all the loopholes and hoops you have to jump through in your medical in the medical systems we have to find doctors that do things etc cetera, etc cetera. you know what i'm talking about because you've been self-employed for much of your entrepreneurial life and it's fucking ridiculous so i'm just wondering why it's so and and everybody <clears throat> that we we always mention um, you know, the health care in the United States, the problems with getting insurance, getting coverage, getting this or that. And we always say it's because that we have been all sold a bill of goods as the country from primarily the Republicans that, oh, you don't want government messing in your health care and, and all the other places that provide it. Well, it sucks there and you have to wait forever and they're all veterinarians. But Brian, you've heard some of these emails, or read some of these emails. Every time we actually have some of these people that have this socialized medicine in every other civilized country in the world, they say, no, we love it. Saved my life. Had cancer, just had to pay for parking. So is, it, is this not a thing that maybe should be addressed as well as whether we can see a doctor or not? And so... Um, so you could get counseling or not instead of, and then, you know, people, they open up GoFundMes for their medical bills because of this in the United States of America, because if you don't have insurance, you don't have the right kind of insurance or whatever the loophole is. Even if you're a millionaire, if you have a major illness, you can go bankrupt. And Somehow we're being told that this is a good thing, and it's it's this all should be tied together, should it not? And then maybe not only we could prevent suicide, but maybe we could also take an, a, a check a look in on some of these people that don't need to own guns and firearms and are a danger to themselves and other people at the same time and prevent some of that. We'd be keeping an eye on them because it would actually be something where you could actually go to a doctor and tell them you have an issue. What do you think, Brian? Well, there are certainly issues in the American healthcare system, but one good thing is that if someone does feel like they need someone to talk to, they don't have to feel stressed out about finding someone or having to go out there and the insurance or whatever. You can call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, 800-273-8255. Another way to remember it, 800-273-TALK, T-A-L-K. Once again, 800-273-8255. There's always someone to talk to. There's always someone on the other side of the line that will give you the time, that will listen to you, that will talk to you, that will help you. And just remember, things always get better. Uh, anyway, but I just hate to hear something like this. And, and while, well, you know, I didn't work with Daphne closely or, you know, know her on a social basis. She was, as I said, was always a nice girl and, and, you know, always enjoyed working alongside her and you never want to hear something like this. It's just, you know, but yeah, once again, Hey, there, you know, the healthcare system, you heard about the uh, state of Texas, more of that. They, they don't want to give us healthcare. They want to take what we've got away. And I'm never going to have an abortion and probably never be the cause of one. I think that's pretty safe at this, at this point in my life. So I have no 
dog in this fight, except that I get pissed off when people get fucked around. And again, people thought that I was being dramatic when I said that Donnie dipshit picking judges would fuck the country up for decades. And guess what? It's fucking the country up for decades. Seven million women in Texas just got fucked and they're going to have to have the baby. And after they finish making abortion illegal in the United States, then the, that's the Republicans goal because there'll be more poor people and children that they can deny more social services to. That's their mission in life. <laughs> what was it? Carlin said, pre-born, we're with you. Preschool, you're fucked. And I just, I'm just amazed at what they're allowing to go on. And that it seems like that even though the, even when the Democrats have the majority, they can't stop it because of a couple of these fucking fence sitting infiltrators that are afraid to go back to their hillbilly states and, and tell the people what's really up. So it just pissed me off, and I just wanted to register that, that I'm sorry. But it, the, there are, the reason why I get so hot about this, like I said, I'm not gay, so I'm not going to get married to another man, and I'm not going to have an abortion, and I'm not going to fucking do a lot of things that they're fucking with people about but it still means they're fucking with people for no reason. And when you have people in elected office making public policy and laws that we all have to live by based on the imagined instructions of an invisible, fictitious, supreme being, I have a problem with that. If it wasn't cloaked in freedom of religion, it would be called delusional. So just remember, adding to your checklist, and we'll move on to the wrestling part of the program. If uh, you vote for a Republican, they will do nothing about climate change. They will do nothing to put restrictions on gun ownership, what you can own, how many you can own, or who can have them. They will do nothing to protect your right to marry who you want, nothing for gay people, because God don't like them. Nothing for health care for anybody. Nothing to prevent the domestic terrorists, a.k.a. themselves, from continuing the lie that dipshit won the election or try to stop him from running again. And nothing to preserve your right to vote at all unless you vote for them. I just, I'm just, we're just keeping a checklist. So there you go. <sighs> I got a couple of emails. The first, and I'm not actually, I'm not even going to read these two because we've been getting a lot of these emails lately. And it's, it, I don't re not want to read them, not because they're not beautifully written emails, great emails, heartfelt emails, but because it starts to sound too self serving. Some of the things that people say about us and our show, Brian, you and me, that I don't want to read this because it, it gets too much. But these are people who have had shitty runs of luck, whether they've, whether COVID, they've lost family or friends or their job, or they're the people, somebody is always having rotten bullshit happen to them around the world. And we get, have been getting more and more emails from people who just say, hey, something about your shows or, you know, just your bullshit helps take my mind off this, makes me feel better, blah, blah, blah. And there's two of them, and I'm still catching up on emails and stuff, but two of them, one is from Eric, and it, it's a long email, and it just broke my heart, but his his little pup Big Mac did not uh, did not make it recently, and I just want to say to Eric, we're sorry about Big Mac, and Anthony, I'm not going to give your last name, but August 19th was your birthday, if that narrows it down, and uh, we're sorry for the bad times that you've been having, but we're glad that we could make it a little easier, and better luck from here, but you know, the point is, we started this thing, I started this thing, and then you came along, and business picked up but i remember when i first started this podcast it was like wow we had thirty thousand people listen last week right that was a big deal and we've always just done it like it's a phone call between us and everybody gets to you know eavesdrop on with commercials 
Um, and we tickle ourselves and, and let everybody in on it. But it means a lot to a lot of people from what they've said to be able to listen to you and me jack off and have fun. And that's why we do a show, but we don't do a show. I'm not We're, jacking off for the record. Well, you know what I mean. I want to make sure they know what I mean. <laughs> well, just so everybody does. But, well, we've already established that, Brian, that you do not fucking fiddle with your bits or whatever we said earlier. <laughs> but anyway, it's nice to hear from people that we are able to cheer them up with our with our silliness and tomfoolery and fr frivolity. Anyway. We appreciate those notes, and we are sorry the show will get better. <laughs> well, yeah, it can't. It, see, that's the thing. Everything always gets better right when it can't get any worse. <laughs> Just like this show. Anyway, speaking of not being able to get much worse, apparently we have not maligned the integrity of these fine folks at Code Academy yet because they are still with us. And, and, and I must say it's been one of the most popular advertising campaigns that we have done here on the program yet, the fine folks at CodeCademy.com. Uh, and, and their efforts to bring me into, and I'm starting to pick some of this up now from, from watching Hotchkiss, putting the new website together and things like that. And I had him listen to the spot and he knew at least two or three of these things that they were talking about. So Code Academy is a, is a, is a fine sponsor with a wonderful sense of humor. And we appreciate that. And as soon as they're able to fucking tell me or i can figure out what they're selling i'll have even we more know we know what they're selling they're but selling no, you know the what fine ability selling. for people to transition into a new career possibly or learn a new skill a skill that will allow you to build your own websites or build other people's websites or fix their problems perhaps hack the pentagon there's so many things you can do with the skills you learn from code academy oh so wait a minute so these people who get on the internet and do all this make all this mayhem and chaos, they're code experts, right? That's right. And for the record, that was a joke. Don't hack the Pentagon. Well, no, but see now, see now you're starting to appeal to the entrepreneur in me because see that way, what? if all these people are, 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 that are hacking in and causing chaos with the power grids and the, and the, the computer systems everywhere, if they're code experts, you know what we need to fight them, don't you? That's other code experts, because nothing stops a bad guy with code except a good guy with code. So there's going to be jobs opening up like crazy for all these people who know how to speak in code or in tongues or whatever it is. So, folks, there's never been a better time to become a programmer, whether you're starting from scratch, looking to advance, or wanting to fight crime. Learning to code might be the easiest way to change your career and Code Academy is the best way to learn code online. They not only teach you job-ready coding skills, but also help you build unique projects for your portfolio and earn certificates, even prep for technical interviews or nuclear wars. Folks, you can get qualified for in-demand jobs in as little as two months. High security clearance for the government may take longer. You can learn at your own pace and your own level, and you can choose what to learn from building websites to analyzing data and everything else you could want. You can learn coding languages, including Python, HTML, CSS, SQL, JavaScript, and, and also the Manhattan Project. And if you're not sure where to begin, Code Academy will point you in the right direction. Folks, it's an amazing world that can open up for you. And if you save the world someday, movies will be made about your life. Join the millions of people learning to code and do whatever after that that comes with it with Code Academy and see where coding can take you. And the government can even give you immunity in case you're a double agent. Get 15% off your Code Academy Pro membership when you go to CodeCademy.com and use the promo code EXPERIENCE. That's promo code EXPERIENCE at CodeCademy, C-O-D-E-C-A-D-E-M-Y, CodeCademy.com, promo code EXPERIENCE. Save the world! Don't hack it! And for the record, we do not guarantee any immunity for anything you do that you shouldn't do. Just want to make sure we put that out there. Well, we do if you do it right. No, we do not guarantee any immunity for anything. We can't no, guarantee we that. You're not a prosecutor. We can't? No. 
Never mind. Unless it's the court of Cornette. Is there a court of Cornette? Ladies and gentlemen, at jimcornette.com, <laughs> starting <laughs> September 11th. Brand new Cornette gavels on sale. He come to judge. He come to judge. There you he go. Come to judge. Pig meat Cornette. All righty. Pig meat Markham. There's a name that will not be mentioned on one other wrestling telecast this week. And by the way, you went right back to laughing with Pig Meat Markham, and here comes the judge. Well, we're tying these things together. See, this is all, it's a, it's a labyrinth of, of clues and insider comments to take you where we want you to go. Okay. All righty. I got a little history, a little wrestling history, a little palate cleanser. Sock it to me. And a, <laughs> or as Richard Nixon would say, sock it to me. <laughs> <laughs> Why was he confused by that? <laughs> I don't. It was, a, it was a question. He added the question mark at the end of the thing, and it just, instead of the exclamation point, St. Louis, great city. We've talked about it recently. I have some more, just a few more notes, and a, uh, something I wanted to bring up to you that I have never thought of before, and nobody else has brought it up, and it seems interesting. Uh, but anyway, in 1954, just so you know, the National Wrestling Alliance act elected Sam Muchnick as president and Frank Tunney of Toronto as the first vice president. We've gone over that. There was a first vice president, a second vice president served, you know. The championship committee in 1954. These were the people that decided the champion. In 1954, Al Haft, Orville Brown, Jim Crockett Sr., Frank Tunney, and Sam Miniker. Wow, that's On the that's championship committee. He was the El Paso promoter at that time. And then he had a stellar booking and announcing career for the next 20 years for uh, Stu Hart and Dick the Bruiser, among others, and then ended up in the 80s, was back in El Paso, and uh, I met him when he stopped by a, uh, a show that World Class did at the Army base there, or the service base. I think it was an Army base. He was also a brilliant plane thief. Yes, he well, he, he brought him back eventually. When he had to fly back into the territory, he generally flew back in a plane that he had left in that uh, was belonged to somebody else. Anyway, <laughs> real quickly, some business statistics. Uh, the Luthez and Leo Namalini series of matches in San Francisco. They met three times in San Francisco in, what, 1953 through 56, right? Those three matches drew 36,740 fans paying $119,455, which in today's money translates to over a million dollars for three uh, three shows. I'm trying to find them right here, and I can't. I actually have all the programs for those shows, and uh, I want to say hello to Frank the Collector, who's out there. Hello, Frank. Um, this was something... That K that I brought something to my attention. There was a blurb in one of the St. Louis programs that said, "Congratulations to Luthez and his wife Freda." And uh, Freda was Lou's second wife, I believe, and he was that he that was he was married to her before Charlie, his his last wife, who was he was married to when he passed away. But they announced congratulations. Their son Jeffrey was born. So. I said, wait a minute, I don't ever remember Luthez talking about or or his son appearing or seeing a picture of his son. And then I went back to Hooker, his biography. And I, I don't remember Thez talking about having children. And there are basically in the entire book, there are like three mentions of his children only one each by name, I think, and a couple of times just oh, I you know I, it was in the forward. Uh, Charlie mentioned that writing the uh, the forward to the reprint that Scott Teal did that uh, he had three sons, and then they're mentioned just quickly and done in the book. And obviously, he and Freda split up uh, at some point, and that's one of the reasons apparently why he continued wrestling as long as he did because it cost him some money. You would have thought somebody cauliflower alley club, some fan fest. Um, there would have been an interview. None of Luthes is and apparently he had three sons, but none of them 
have ever been public figures or acknowledged or heard from in any way. And I've just, I was to the point where I had to go back and read the book again to make sure that I knew that he had him. He made sure to give his son a name that he couldn't get involved in wrestling. No one's going to book Jeff Thez. Here in the main event, <laughs> Jeff Thez. Uh, it was Jeff, and the other one was Bob, and there was another son. But anyway, um, I wonder if they're even still alive, or that Thez had made to have grandchildren around. And it, with all the other family members and descendants that you hear from of famous great wrestlers like that, it's it's odd. I just I thought I'd bring that up. And Charlie is a very nice woman. Is that a Southern thing? I just don't know women named Charlie. No, it's it's unusual, but I well see that's a. It's, I don't. I'm just assuming because I don't know. I've well, never I don't met a woman know named what Charlie. Her birth certificate says it might be Charlene or Charlize or oh, something like that. But the, the, but she was just always known as Charlie and very very nice, very sweet woman. Quite a bit younger than Lou. You would have had to have been to kept up with him, right? Anyway, so if anybody knows anything about the descendants of Lou Thez, do they even know? How much he's still talked about to this day, one wonders. And did they inherit anything? Well, now what? Now you're going for artifacts and memorabilia. Frank the Collector. Who's got the there. Who's got the Thez belt right now? Does Charlie still have it, or did was, did, was it given to someone? I want to say Triple H bought it, but I could be wrong. If it isn't Triple H, I want to say it was bought. It was either Triple H or it was Japan. I, I would almost be willing to put money that it's yeah. not in the Fez family anymore. And I think Triple H may have it. Or WWE. Triple H's office in WWE. Who knows how much longer he'll be holding on to that office. But the last time I saw Holy some Holy mackerel, you think? Are they going to start charging him rent next month on that corner office, you think? They're moving into uh, a new he, office he, place. Is, is he coming with them? <laughs> no, it's Triple Trip, you stay over here just to make sure the late mail comes in, gets to the right place. We'll we'll let you know when we've got a place ready for you at the new spot. Anyway, real quickly, a little more history. St. Louis, I've also discovered during the mid-50s, apparently after the network TV uh, ran its course and St. Louis, as we've mentioned, didn't have... Uh, had TV from 53 through 55 and then was off television as a local product until wrestling at the chase in 59. So they appeared to go through a slump at the gate. The houses weren't being reported. Um, if you did see one, it, what you would think would be a big match that would sell out a few years before only did seven, 8,000 people. But then there was somewhat of a resurgence, especially they had a nice little streak in 1963. I just wanted to, uh, give a couple of these statistics in February. And by the way, remember now they're doing every two weeks. This is not, uh, I'm not going to give you all of them, but the high points, February 15th of 1963, Thez versus Pat O'Connor and Dick, the bruiser versus John Paul Henning, famous baby face of the era. You remember that name drew 11,198 people. They came back two weeks later without the Thez, uh, no Thez O'Connor rematch. Instead, Bruiser and John Paul Henning in the main event with Bronco Nagurski as referee and sold out 12,695, and the report was thousands were turned away. Then they come back two weeks later with Thez against Bruiser for the NWA title and did 12,727 sell out in advance. So there were apparently none turned away because they had already been told not to come. In April, Thez and Bruiser, another match, did almost 11,000. In June 15th, Thez and Bill Miller and Bruiser and Von Erich did 11,293. Uh, February 7th, 1964, Bruiser and Thez again, 12,110. You can see why Dick the Bruiser became real good friends with Sam Muchnick. Uh, on May 16th, 1964, Thez faced Fritz Von Erich and... On the card was the first father-son team ever in St. Louis, Dory Funk Sr. and Jr., and they sold out 12,191. They went to the arena October 2nd, 1964, Thez versus Fritz Von Erich. It was the first time they'd gone to the arena, the big building, in over five years and did almost 15,000 people. 
January 1st of 1965, Kaniski in a handicap match against Fritz von Erich and Pat O'Connor. And let's remember the St. Louis handicap matches were not two against one. It was you got to beat the one guy and then you got to beat the second guy in one-on-one -on -one matches. They did 12,149 people with 3,000 turned away. And then came back February 5th of 65. Thez and O'Connor went an hour Broadway in front of over 12,000. April 9th, 65, Thez and Bruiser at the arena did over 13,000. So the early 60s through the mid-60s, St. Louis was doing incredible business. And when you just take into account those shows, much less all the other ones that were doing seven, eight, nine, ten thousand 10,000 people, that's a 300,000 ticket a year town for some of those years. To look at Sam's business, how many other outside attractions outside of wrestling was he bringing in to St. Louis? I know he did the Globetrotters, right? Yes, he did. Um, and this is like Jim Crockett Sr. Uh, they were promoters in town, and they had offices, and they were sports promoters specifically, but they would branch off and do other things. And I think Muchnick did the Globetrotters, and I'm trying to remember, did he dabble at one point with boxing? Early on, possibly. Crockett did the Globetrotters. Crockett also did uh, country music shows and dances. And actually, when I got that stuff from the Crockett office, uh, there were some flyers down in the bottom of one of the boxes from Cab Calloway shows in Charlotte from the late 40s. Oh, wow. And And they also, of course, obviously Crockett branched off into the minor league baseball team there as well as the Charlotte Orioles. So, you know, they took advantage of, you know, what the, the, the infrastructure they had to promote other types of events. And they were noted and it just spread their notoriety around, you know, town as, as being involved in major events that you wanted to go see. Anyway. And we still haven't solved the mystery of the Thez offspring. We'll get that at a later date. Has anybody solved the mystery of NXT yet? What is going? Are they being held hostage? Is there is there a ransom note been given? Who's gonna Who's gonna come out with custody of NXT? Do you think? We'll see what happens. I mean, the problem is if the kidnapper constantly forgets that he's there kidnapping you, what do you do? Well, yeah, wait. Now, wait a minute. The, the, the main kidnapper has help. That's Apparently, right. That's right. What if a kidnapper has a stooge? You never think of that. See, I think that the biggest attraction probably in a year that they can put out on pay-per-view or on a big show or on the cock or whatever the case may be is Vince McMahon, Bruce Pritchard, Johnny Ace, and Kevin Dunn against Triple H, Shawn Michaels, who are we going to get to, to to bolster the NXT side there? They seem to be outnumbered. How much you want to bet Sean would turn on Hunter? Well, if, I, if the money was right. Su uh, if, yeah. the man, if the money was right. If the, the breeze was right. Super kick and he's <laughs> over there by Vince and Bruce. So who is this? Now, where does Stephanie stand in all this? What's what's her job these days? If 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 Bruce is supposed to be overseeing creative and Johnny Ace is the talent relations guy and Vince is the major domo of the land of fruits and nuts he's the head cashew um where do, where does stephanie fit in these days is she gonna is she gonna pick triple h or in the uh divorce proceedings or is she gonna pick her dad when when, when they when they decide when they divorce wwe from nxt and decide who gets custody of the wrestlers whose side is she gonna be on She'll be exactly where she is, chief brand officer, going out and meeting with a bunch of people who know nothing about wrestling and giving them a fluff speech about the wonderful world of wrestling and the wonderful things her family has done and, of course, her childhood friend, Andre the Giant. She used to do uh, tap dances on his palm, from what I understand. I don't know what she was tapping on, but yeah, I think she'll be fine. Triple H, though, this poor guy, I'm starting to feel bad for him for the first time in my life. This poor... <laughs> Poor Paul Levesque. This poor beleaguered individual. Here's something you've never heard before. I can't believe Paul Levesque got outplayed. I can't believe politically Paul Levesque is where he is right now. And, you know, I've, I must admit, I always do this whenever I'm wrong or mistaken in any way. I publicly admit it. I, 
long time ago, I said, well, you can't fire the son-in-law. Apparently you can. What does it say? Not only what does it say about the future of NXT that Vince McMahon, Bruce Pritchard, and, and Johnny Ace, and to any lesser extent, Kevin Dunn, are going to be in charge of the product. It'll look like, I mean, T.L. Hopper may finally get the run he's been waiting for. What does it say of the uh, for the product of NXT? But what does it say for the the job that tr that Vince McMahon is acknowledging that Triple H has done or hasn't done with NXT? It's it's been the most watchable program. It's if you if you were going to see a good match, chances are you were going to see it on NXT. If you were going to see a good match with big stars, chances are you're going to see it on well whatever. Roman Reigns has been on SmackDown before that Raw. But if you were going to see a good match just involving wrestlers, NXT was it. So we're going to lose that now. We're in, and we're going to talk about last week's NXT. It may be dr sinking from our grasp as we speak, but uh, <clears throat> what's it going to look like? Is he going to have greener talent doing more WWF style horse shit instead of Maybe an actual wrestling match breaking out every once in a while? Is that what NXT is going to become? That's what I'm wondering about. Less about the talent that'll be used and more about the WWE brand of horseshit, the Vince McMahon style of comedy. That's what I'd be more afraid of. <sighs> if, if Vince McMahon is the one approving the NXT scripts, what do you think he's going to approve? And no, let me change that. If Bruce is <laughs> approving the NXT scripts, what do you think he's going to, in his head, think Vince is going to want him to do? The goon. T.L. Hop, Freddie Joe Floyd. <sighs> I watched a few minutes of NXT. I'm not going to jump in during your review because I didn't see enough of it to say anything. I just, after seeing that new logo, had to see how colorful and how full of life NXT. I figured it was going to be just a psychedelic explosion of color. And it was the same dark, dull shit it is every week. So I'm dying to see this revamp and what it's going to be. Why release a logo if you're not ready to use it, though? Because I didn't see that logo on the show. Because, I saw the old logo. Because I'm telling you, because Vince and the people that work in the company not related to the wrestling end are constantly convinced that, oh, my God, a new logo. This is going to catch people's attention and make them talk. They think that they think that the people that watch the wrestling program care about the logos and the, and the bullshit that they all care about. And so they, sometimes that is pushed to the for, forefront more than, Hey, we're actually going to have a good show with some good talent. And sometimes it's pushed to the forefront to cover up for the fact that, Hey, we're not going to really have a very good show with very good talent. But, uh, and I mean, from my experience with Bruce and Johnny Ace together, anywhere around developmental will be, and I'm not even trying to, I've knocked Johnny all day long. I'm not even trying to knock Bruce when I say this, but he just, he thinks like old fashioned WWF, which was not that good to begin with, but at least it had names from the territories to perpetrate it. And they halfway knew what they were doing and how to get something over. Now, You've got, if you apply the same thing to people who have never been in the territories, never been involved with wrestling and have learned from the ground up, it's just going to be a goddamn bunch of fucking gimmicks. Just a bunch of gimmicks. Because that's what Vince wants and that's when <laughs> Bruce thinks it makes him interesting. And he does not. People say that I'm out of touch. I didn't actually hear that the last time that I... The last two times that I followed him into a company producing some of the younger talent, <laughs> I wasn't the one that they were rolling their eyes about, talking about what he thought they should do. I was the one they were saying, oh, thank you. Tell me more about that. So we'll see what happens, what is, as, what is as you often say. But what? I, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, what does that tell you? People could put two and two together and figure it out, but... You heard things from your perspective, and I obviously have different ways of hearing things in different people. I heard things. Nothing but horrible reviews from Bruce Pritchard behind the scenes in a couple of different places. 
where he worked with talent who may not have wanted to work with him very long. That reputation. And then he goes back and look at what he's doing now. This is why morale is at an all-time low. This kind of shit right here. Well, should we uh, further lower the morale by running briefly through NXT from August 31st this past Tuesday night? Whose morale do you think you'll hurt more, the talent or the listeners, if you do the NXT review? Well, it, it won't take too long. That's the best part about it. They opened the show with Mandy Rose coming down the aisle with her cohorts, old Gigi Allen and Jane Wayne Gacy. I would like to see extensive video on all three of those young ladies, but none of it involving wrestling or speaking. Will you stop it? And Mandy <laughs> Rose was at a singles contest against Saray. She's from Japan and is barely as tall as the top rope. And 12 minutes later, we had an interview with Tommaso Ciampa in the back. And that was really good. Because he talks like he looks. He doesn't say things that are off-putting coming out of a face and body that looks like that. And his voice matches the appearance as well. So th and, and he sounds like he's kind of saying shit that he believes and or thought of rather than just reciting memorized droning. Um, then remember I said last week, some guy that I've never seen before just came up to Kyle O'Reilly in the back, and just slapped him in the face and they got in a fight. Well, apparently that young man's name is Duke Hudson and he's six feet five and they say he's 270 pounds and <laughs> I believe he's six foot five. But if, if Pac is a guy who weighs 180 and I say he looks 220, this guy weighs 270 and looks 230. He's tall and rangy and a little clean cut for a heel. Trimmed beard, wonderful metrosexual haircut. He, I swear to God, this is a Johnny A special. He's a modern Mark Jindrak. He's a big, plain looking white guy that is, he's, he's big. So he makes other people look small, but he doesn't look big himself. I just looked him up. His real name is Brendan Vink. He's from Australia. He's an Australian professional wrestler. And the reason I bring this up, because this made me laugh for whatever reason. On February 11, 2019, it was announced that Vink had signed a contract with WWE and he would report to the Performance Center. Vink debuted under his real name at an NXT house show on March 15th, 2019, defeating Nick Camarado. <laughs> Oh, well, when did he become Duke Hudson? Uh, anyway, O'Reilly won this one with a beautiful knee drop off the top rope onto the guy's leg and then knee barred him and Duke Hudson tapped out. Is O'Reilly the top baby face there now? Well, I I don't know what you can't tell by their pecking order. Um, as far as who they consider the top what, but he's one of the best ones, if that tells you anything. Elia Dragunov was in the ring for a promo and he came out limping and had stitches in his head and the people were chanting, you deserve it. And this kid has a great smile and I'm going to give him some, some constructive criticism because I really like him and he's got, he's got something and if they use it, he'll get over. He forced the promo. He put too much emphasis on, on some of the, the ending lines of the statement, and, and he try, he was trying to force it unnaturally. If he gears back a little bit and he's more natural with his delivery, he's working hard, he can get better, he's great in the ring, but I'm talking about promos. This is a guy that can get past the size disadvantage because he's likable. He's one of those people that you're going to like if he learns how to speak naturally to them instead of at them, and then they come, they let him. But he's a likable Russian. Imagine that. Uh, but yeah, he just he just forced some of this where it trying to put too much bass in his voice, and it it came off like he was. There's nothing worse. A baby face has to be more natural. A heel can go way over the top, and sometimes it helps. But a baby face has to be more natural and has to speak to the people 
and you have to believe him more. And this guy's got a believable face, and his matches are believable, and his smile's believable. The delivery needs to be. Uh, Kaylee Ray did a sit-down interview. Next, Carmelo Hayes was in the back with his briefcase. He gets a title shot in, and he's in. Now the Lucha suits have some woman with them. Now there's four of them. And uh, Pablo Escobar, the leader of the group, came in and recited some the heck out of some lines at old Carmelo Hayes. And then, I swear, this is on national television, by the way. Marcel Bartel and Fabian Eichner, the unwieldy named Imperium team, I feel, okay, I, they really got over with me when they were working with those greenhorns last week, and they're they're good. They just don't have a lot of oomph to them, and the, the names are, as I mentioned, unwieldy. Guess who they put them in a tag team match with? I have I that was not a rhetoric. I don't know. I don't I don't know who's there anymore. <laughs> Drake Maverick and Grayson Waller. Who's that? I, exactly. We know Drake Maverick. He's as big as a hiccup, right? And uh, he's a nice, names. nice young boy. My God, these but names. he's fucking minute. And Grayson Waller, who they gave an interview to. He was the overconfident one, and Drake was trying to drag him back to reality. But, oh, we got this. This is great. And fuck it. Grayson Waller. Waller around in the holler. Uh, I mean, this this harkened me back to the days of TBS with the, the, some of the, but those guys were, re their names were real. <laughs> that was really Vernon Deaton's name, you know, and shit. Grayson Waller. Um, looking, anyway. I'm looking at his Twitter profile for the record. It says Grayson Waller, FKA, formerly known as Matty Wahlberg. <laughs> what, what is he? One of the fucking illegitimate Wahlberg brothers? Has he got a got a piece of the burger chain? If that is his name, it's a much better name than Grayson Waller. What the hell is that? Dipshit McGee is a better name than Grayson Waller. Dipshit McGee and his wife Tits. Uh, anyway, I didn't watch that match, for fuck's sake. They did some more bullshit with Johnny Sameface and the love story between Indy Hartwell and Dexter Loomis. Then uh, Oni Lorcan, Pete Dunn, Ridge Holland, and Danny Birch are all a group now, and they did a promo about Champa. And yeah, a lot of bald people. Suddenly, the two girls that are tagging her out are tagging around. Well, hanging around, tagging around with uh, Mandy Rose, old Gigi Allen, and Jane Wayne Gacy found Soraya in the locker room and beat the shit out of her. She must have done something to piss somebody off. And then, Brian, I couldn't believe my eyes. I've been waiting to see L.A. Knight get a chance to shine and do what he does. Um since he's, you know, been in the comedy thing with Cameron Grimes, and that was a little silly. Guess who they put L.A. Knight with? I won't even wait for you to not guess. Thank you. I'll say it. Johnny Sameface. Oh, no. <laughs> no. So, and I, I wrote Jesus. I wrote VKM. That's how I write Vince's name. It's habit from 25 years ago. But Jesus, Vince is already pissed, and they're still using Johnny Sameface, the poster boy for bland, small, pasty white amateur talent. Where is Austin Theory? He's the one out of that group I wanted to see. He disappeared. He used to live with the same faces. Now he's, did they lock him up in the crawl space? So anyway, I can't, I like LA Knight. I can't watch a match with Johnny same face in it. And I'm mortified that what might happen at the end and that even that LA Knight has to be competitive with this guy. But I fast forwarded anxiously, LA Knight won. Basically, but the only reason he won was when Dexter Loomis offered same face a high five. And they're acting like, oh, Loomis doesn't understand the concept of the high five thing or touching humans or whatever. And L.A. Knight come up from behind him, hit his hit his finish. Woo! So L.A. Knight now needs distraction and help to beat a five foot eight, hundred and eighty five pound person. 
Um, they had another singles match. I, this is on national TV, folks. I don't, maybe now that I think about this, can it get any worse? Can Vince and Bruce and Ace fuck this up or has somebody already beaten them to it? Jesse Kamehameha, you know, the girl that's with Frankie Monet and Robert Stone. Jesse Kamehameha has gotten a makeover from Frankie Monet. And she's in a single match with Raquel Gonzalez. So every time I tune in hoping to see Frankie Monet, who looks gorgeous, who's beautiful, who looks like a star, she's in the corner and I'm watching flunkies. Do you ever notice Raquel Gonzalez is taller than half of the male members of this roster? I've noticed. She's tall and rangy. Big. And, uh... <laughs> big just plain big now come on you're not supposed to say that about you're not supposed to make comments about i just, a meant, woman tall. I just meant tall i just meant okay. bigger than the the dakota kai's of the you're world you're not talking about her her body type no, 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 or frame no, no, no. or whether she's buxom or flat or hippie or will you, will you stop it i didn't say any of these things she's, I, well, she's bigger than the rest of the roster you she's tall you said she's tall you weren't saying that she was in any way Outshaped or ill no, no, I have not or whatever. Stop it. I have not said any of these things. You wouldn't do that. No, no you never. Never. Do. Never. So Raquel Gonzalez just picked this girl up and threw her down like a sack of feed. One, two, three. Wade Barrett sat down with Samoa Joe. Joe, another guy who speaks well, sounds real. Um my prophecy is he's an interim champion. I don't know where they're going to next. I don't, because some people are going to say, oh, will he have a long reign like he did in Ring of Honor or this or that? No, I I think they came up on a situation, much as OVW used to, pushed upon them by main roster decisions. And and Joe's a good place to have that belt and and make sure that people take it seriously and it's, it's credibility but uh, I, th- as, I mean, I may be, I wouldn't mind him being a long reigning champion, but I have a feeling they're just trying to, they're going to set something up so that they can switch it somewhere else long term. What do you think? Well, I mean, long term, of course, but I don't know. It's a weird position to be in right now in NXT. It's like purgatory. Well, yeah, because I'm wondering who else needs to be the NXT champion looking at this program. It should be Austin Theory. and He's not there. So who else? Well, I and I wouldn't make him the NXT champion just from zero to hero in five seconds, but he's got such tremendous talent and potential, and you never see him. I don't know what the except when he was a stooge for same face. I don't know what's going on with this guy. Anyway, uh, Roderick Strong is now in a group called the Diamond Mine. The manager is Malcolm Bivens, and his group is a Japanese guy and two pudgy white guys. And it looks like Roderick Strong walking to the ring with the ring crew. (laughs) And he fucking faced a guy named Ikemon Iro. What was his name? Ikemon, I-K-E, I wrote this off the graphic, I-K-E-M-E-N-J-I-R-O. Ikemon Iro, who is Japanese, and he took this match against Roderick Strong because Kushida, they gave him an interview, by the way. And he said this. He took the match because Kushida is his idol. And automatically I knew I didn't want to see this fucking guy. And you know what? I was right. He got in the ring. This fucking clown starts the match, works the match in a yellow pajama top with his face all over it, doing flips. And one of the fucking trademark things that he does is take his jacket, which, as I mentioned, looks like a satin pajama top, and he spreads it out and makes a face for the cameras. That's why he's wearing an unbuttoned pajama top to wrestle. Roddy won. They had the uh, girls tag teams, when's, two of them. When's, when's his contract up? God damn, I hope soon if this is where he's stuck. Because, you know, that would be nice to, if, if, you know, if, half the Undisputed Era is gone already. If they could just allow the other half to move reasonably toward the door, we could get the Undisputed Era in AEW. And then we'd have a real elite instead of the fake elite. Do you think Vince is going to see anything in Kyle O'Reilly? No. I don't, just because 
I mean, obviously, I don't think Vince has been watching NXT on television, or else he, he wouldn't have been surprised at what he was seeing, positively or negatively. It's it, That's what... It, when OVW was developmental, you still knew that Vince had no idea what these guys had ever done until they showed up for a dark match. You'd, it, it's, it's, it's a, every time he's ever hired anybody, He's seen them for the first time when they walk in his office to sign the contract. So I guarantee you that if 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 Vince had seen O'Reilly's work, worked with him closely, knew his backstory, gotten to know him, yeah, it'd be a fucking gimme, a no-brainer. But just look at Kyle O'Reilly for the first time. I don't think that's a visual that fucking Vince McMahon is going to go for. So, and that's just... it's The problem is, before... In centuries gone by, Vince had enough people around him, Pat Patterson, Jerry Briscoe, Jim Ross, myself, for whatever that was worth, when I'd beat him over the head about some people that would actually say, no, this guy's good, you've got to look, you've got to watch, we need him here. Now he's relying on people that don't either don't know what the fuck to look for in a wrestler or are going to look for everything they already know that Vince looks for in a wrestler. It doesn't matter what they can do. But anyway, having said that, here I've I've got to reverse my opinion on Ridge Holland. Because last week, I believe it was, he looked like shit. Remember that? I said, boy, this guy's green. He's got a lot of potential, but they got to keep it basic because it's just it's this ain't happening. Timothy Thatcher was the guy he was working with. I thought, well, this guy, Thatcher, he knows what he's doing. I think it was a clash of styles. I don't know what the difference was, or maybe somebody just talked to Ridge, because against Tommaso Ciampa, this was a good match, and Ridge Holland looks far beyond what he looked like last week. And part maybe because it was a different kind of match. This was more of a fight. Ch uh, Thatcher was trying to really wrestle, whereas this was wilder. Uh, Tommaso so good. He took it to him and he's physical and his style works with Hollins. And I, I just, I enjoyed this a lot better. They traded forearms that looked good. Boy, can Champa sell the body language and everything. And Ridge Holland was heelish and stayed on him. Champa made a comeback. All his shit looked good. Um, Ridge Holland stopped him with an Alabama slam. That jackknife thing pulled the legs over the head deal back first to the mat. And besides the fact that Champa's had a bad neck, the referee stepped in and teased, wanting to check, teased stopping it, whatever, and it stopped their momentum, I thought. But Holland got back on him and worked on the back. They did a better one-two exchange than I've seen in the middle of the ring in quite a while. Boom, 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 boom with body language and staggering. They went out to the floor later in the match. Holland, Oklahoma stampeded uh, Champa into the barricade and started trading chops on the apron, and Champa got in the ring and hit that fucking widow's bell, the draping Zabada that he does. Boom, one, two, three. That was probably... Uh, well, it was definitely the best wrestling match on the show and the second best match that I saw between NXT and AEW this week. But then, of course, the rest of the heel Englishmen have to attack Champa, and here comes MSK out, that ragtag tag team, and they fought some of the uh, Birch and Lorcan, I think, who took big bumps on the floor, but MSK comes out. There's four heels on Champa. These two jabronis come out and the heels all powder and the heels had a billy club. So four of them and a bill and a billy club ran from a fresh tag team and Champa beaten down. And that was the show. So what actually does Vince McMahon and Bruce Pritchard and Johnny Ace have left to tear apart? Not good. It doesn't sound appealing at all. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. And Austin Theory, if we're going to put his picture on the side of a milk carton, do they still do that, or is that another one of my jokes that the kids ain't going to get? I'm not sure if they still do that. I haven't seen a milk carton in a while. I don't drink milk. We usually but it get used it in to be funny. Containers. Yeah, well, it, it used to be funny. 
That was a funny joke 25 years ago. You used to drink milk. I used to drink milk. And they used to be hungry in Ethiopia, but now all of the meaning of all these things sometimes gets called into question. But you know what I'm thinking about doing, Brian? Next time I watch NXT, I'm just going to watch the show on the screen, but I'm going to plug in the Raycon wireless earbuds and listen to my own soundtrack because it'll probably put me in a better mood. What do you think you'll listen to? Anything. Probably us. <laughs> I always put myself in a good mood. You're going to watch wrestling by listening to us review other wrestling? No, I'm going to listen to us talking about the wrestling that I'm watching because if it's AEW, it's the same thing every week, right? But nevertheless, folks, if you want to listen to what you want to listen to, then you got to go to the Raycon earbuds. We've been talking about these things for ages. You can create your own soundtrack by popping them into your ears, and they come with a bunch of gel tips, which are comfortable, and they don't stick out of your ears and have all those wires and stems. You don't look like a Martian. They've got a 32-hour battery life, so you can listen to what you want, when you want, for a really long time. Could you listen to anything for 32 hours straight, Brian? I think so. Probably, you know, Elvis Costello or Miles Davis. Oh, maybe John sake. Coltrane, the Beatles, Velvet no, Underground. No, you couldn't listen to anything Clash. for 32 hours straight, because if you did, you'd be a raving lunatic. So there's plenty of battery hour life for the, the average person. Who doesn't want to listen to something for 32 hours straight? This is not mental warfare here. Anyway, Raycons come with a 45-day happiness guarantee, so you can't lose. If you give them a try, you'll see what we mean. Right now, our listeners, the cult of Cornette out there, can get 15% off their Raycon order at buyraycon.com slash J-C-E. That's buyraycon, B-U-Y-R-A-Y-C-O-N, dot com slash jce 15 percent off your entire order it's amazing it's incredible it's real that's right they're real they're real they really exist in this world and they're spectacular what exists in your world this week on the various arcadian vanguard podcast network programming that is a great question. I could probably answer best if I knew what week it was. But ladies and gentlemen, get information about all the shows on Twitter at Super Podcasts or on Facebook, facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. A few notes. The latest episode of Stick to Wrestling with John McAdam out right now. A deep dive look at one of the great summers, one of the great years of professional wrestling. 1986. Hogan and Orndorff, The Great American Bash. Andre the Giant as a machine. Hear about all of that and so much more at McAdamPod.com or look for Stick to Wrestling with John McAdam wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Want to make mention of the latest Patreon episode of Breaking Cafe with Baldrin and Barry available for patrons of the show. Patreon.com slash Baldrin and Barry. The boys talk with Greg Gagne of the AWA. And boy, does he usually have some stories to tell. Hear that interview today patreon.com slash Baldrin and Barry. And don't forget to listen to Breaking Kayfib with Baldrin and Barry each and every week, wherever you find your favorite podcast. They just had a great two-part interview with referee Jimmy Jett. Hear that today? I remember him. He had nothing good to say about you. But of course, the no six o son of a bitch. The 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership! <laughs> New episode should be out next week <laughs> uh, if everything is going as planned as of right now and i'm back on sleep ladies and gentlemen i'm soon to be back on food then a new episode should be out next week stay tuned for more information next week here on the show go through the archives today at 605pod.com available wherever you find your favorite podcasts the mothership <laughs> yeah you've had a lot of New additions and product launches and emissions and things coming out lately. I'm surprised you can't keep I'm not surprised you can't keep them all straight. Launched a lot of ships. Yes, ships passing in the night. Apparently, you don't pass too many ships in the night. You you bump into them head first. Anyway. Oh, God, we got to talk about it now. Actually, it wasn't so bad this week. There's been worse weeks. I've seen worse. Have you? Well, yeah, from them. Um, 
nothing made me turn the television off. It, I just forgot to watch sometimes. But AEW did uh, Dynamite again this past week, like they do every week on Wednesday. They're still over a million with the addition of Mr. Punk. So they got that going for them. And, I mean, I, I hate to see sometimes when our prophecies come true right in front of our eyes on the TV screen or our opinions are validated or our statements are confirmed, verified, whatever. You know, you know what I'm saying. I hate it when we're right. We finally, again, after the gruesome injury to Cash Wheeler several weeks ago on TV because of their shitty substandard ring, we now get to see FTR wrestle again, and against Santana and Ortiz, we were looking forward to this. And we end up being right. All I can think about is we end up being right. They have another great match. And they do another great job. <laughs> Does anybody know when the last time that FTR won a match on television was? I wonder. Has this been recorded for posterity? Was it chiseled into the side of a cave wall? I don't Can remember. Can you remember? I can't remember. No. Anyway, and they actually they started this out. They were trying. They showed highlights of FTR's rivalry with Santana and Ortiz, which were three incidents spread out over a period of several months, right? And they've had a few canned interviews. Uh, Santana and Ortiz came out with the face paint on. They mean business. I think the last thing that this company needs is any more gimmicks on its guys that already have gimmicks, and they look like panda bears. But having said that, I appreciate FTR with the nod to the Midnight Express with the Midnight Express trunks. But I was hoping, I was hoping for for the best here. I started out enjoying this. I'm the, okay, instead of starting out the show with a 30-minute Hardly Boys circle jerk, we start with a wrestling match. It looks good. Santana and Ortiz did some flipping, but they made it look violent. Uh, FTR did a nice blind tag, and the announcer, nobody noticed it. I don't think the referee noticed it. They got some heat on Ortiz. It was nice to see an actual heel tag team work. And, uh, you know, Santana and Ortiz, as we mentioned, when they're, when they're straight and they're not having that goofy or be a part of the multi-man chaos, they're good. Uh, they did a little misdirection play with the taking the, the buckle pad off, but it didn't really come into play, the bare buckle. I thought after they got the heat on Ortiz, he jumped the gun on the hot tag. Just as Cash tagged Dax, in, in, Ortiz rolled straight to Santana and just tagged him. Dax was going to come in. Ortiz could have gone to the neutral corner so that Dax could have rushed him so he could have rolled past him or something, but it just, boom, tag. All right. I'm nitpicking, I guess, but it would have been lovely. Santana and Ortiz, then they did multiple double teams in, right in front of the referee. Multiple, not just one teamwork move, but like three in a row, and it kind of buried Cash for not coming in to do anything. Did you notice FTR did the Midnight Express double suplex spear small package spot and did it perfectly? Uh, I haven't seen that in a while. I haven't seen that since the last time I, I gave it to somebody Ring of Honor, I think. And they did it perfectly, which shows that they pay attention because you ought to see the consternation in the ring when when guys try to do that fucking little simple fucking thing and they tackle the guy on the left instead of the guy on the right. And then everybody falls in a heap because it doesn't work that way. And then they're like, what the fuck happened? But this was perfect. Santana and Ortiz aren't as smooth going into the double teams as FTR are. I think part of that reason is because their shit is more complicated, requires a little more cooperation. And I wish they'd work more on trying to flow into it and not set up some contrived thing. But if, if they could work more with a team like FTR, Santana and Ortiz, they could learn timing. They could learn. They've got so much potential. They're just always in with these you know, other goofballs. I have to call something. Dax tagged cash in while he was standing on the second rope. I have to be fair and call it. That's bullshit. 
they did a big false finish after FTR hit the the big rig, which used to be the Goodnight Express, which used to be the Shatter Machine. And then suddenly, Santana and Ortiz just did a bunch of shit in quick succession to cash, and boom, and one, two, three. Legal, moral, and ethical in the middle of the ring. No controversy. FTR has become the most talented, highest paid job team in wrestling history. And again, I'm not saying that Santana and Ortiz need to win once in a while, too. The same thing kind of is happening to them. You never see them have a tag match, but when you do, they usually actually win it. <clears throat> in this case, FTR <laughs> got goddamn just humiliated by the Young Bucks and then left off and forgotten about and come back and they got a win in a fucked up match against Santa, Santana and Ortiz where Cash got hurt. Who knows if that was even the original finish? I don't fucking know. And then they come back and get beat clean. Tully does nothing. Nobody does nothing. And how many months will it be till we see them again? Because they make, especially the executive vice presidents in charge of the tag team division, look like fucking amateur hour contestants every time they get in the ring and perform at a high level. So they can't be allowed to do that. We were right again, Brian. You know, it depends on what you believe. It depends on who you listen to. Some may think FTR are a casualty of a loaded tag team division. That unfortunately, there are so many high quality teams that FTR just can't get on TV. Others may think that the Young Bucks, a bit upset that other people thought that FTR were the best tag team in wrestling, brought them in to beat them and never let them ever get another match. There are different schools of thought out there. The only loaded tag team division, the, the head of the tag team division, they're the ones that are loaded. Come to think of it, they don't even do drugs. They're no, just if they were loaded, it may be own. good. If they were loaded, it may be good. It might be. Um, I have no problem with Santana and Ortiz winning a match. This isn't about that. Although, I again, Santana seems really good. Ortiz is always, if there's ever a flub in a match, it's Ortiz. But this, to me, wasn't the time. You're coming off the injury to Cash. I never want to see that video or any images of that hook yeah. in the arm again. But they've used it. People saw it. They played it up. Dax and Cash did the best promos they've ever done. Mind you, they were in clip form for seconds on the show. But what we saw was great. <laughs> and then they lose here. And coming out of it, they took all the steam off FTR, all the juice off FTR. And for everyone that has said, Oh, I wish Jim Cornette would have done something on air. Here are your yeah. two options. The Tully Blanchard role or the Dan Lambert role. Neither one of them. Any good. I feel bad for FTR. I feel bad about the situation they're in. I think a lot of people know the realities. A lot of people, probably in years ahead, will talk a little bit more about the realities behind the scenes. But it was a good match for what it was. The finish left me feeling flat. And every match on this program has an afterbirth. But the one where they could have at least jumped Santana and Ortiz, got a little steam on them, and kept the fucking deal going. No, it just beat them, get the fuck out of there. It's it's way past obvious. And I think it was also the time for an FTR win. It's, it's the, the time for an FTR win or five was when they first came in a year and a half ago or whatever it was. And, they did, and the first thing they did was good boot. Uh, anyway. 2.0 and Daniel Garcia did a promo. And I said the chubby 2.0 guy is doing Randy Savage. He's great. I like He's that doing guy. ICW Randy Savage. Not over the top WWF Randy Savage, but more ICW Randy Savage. And Garcia looks 16 years old. And I mean he's very serious, very serious face, but he's, you know. But anyway, they they're basically they're they're wanting to get noticed. They're gonna they're there to I can't remember the exact verbiage. They're gonna disrupt some things, they're gonna piss in somebody's post toasties, they're gonna get some attention, right? And that just happened to play there. And then here comes the magic man again. The 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 true demo god, the ratings bonanza. 
CM Punk and back in Chicago. Music and chants and signs and excitement and et cetera. And I'm saying, okay, maybe they'll get two in a row. Well, count three, counting the rampage, but we're we're talking uh, just on dynamite. I wanted to like this. I liked many parts of it, and I see where they were going, and we'll talk about it, and we'll talk about what they could have done. I saw some people saying that, well, they've ruined the whole thing now. It's not that bad. But this was, unfortunately, it, when they laid it out verbally, if it had been performed as it was supposed to be, I would have been with this. I I can't call out punk on this because if they had done it right, it would have been fine. But the problem was they needed heel fodder for punk to get physical and for the thing they wanted to do to bring Darby Allen and punk together in the ring. They picked the wrong people to do it. And those people's performance got the first little bit of bullshit on punk that he's gotten since he's been there. I will elaborate. Punk starts the promo and he's speaking to the people again. He didn't promo them. I, like I said, great baby faces. They're genuine. People can tell he means it. He created some doubt. Am I still as good as after seven years? So he could let the fans disagree. You still got it. This was very good. Verbally, everything's great. All of a sudden, you hear the people react and Punk turns to the side and he goes after somebody. It looks like a mark is hitting the ring and actually that's what it was, kind of. Here comes Daniel Garcia and 2.0 and they hit the ring and Punk meets him and they start fighting. I've mentioned this about this Garcia. He went from we've never heard of this fucking guy's existence before to he's in everything. He's the Forrest Gump of wrestling now. I saw a picture of Ford's theater the night of the Lincoln assassination. There was Daniel Garcia in the orchestra pit. And this is where we went sideways. They were supposed to attack punk three on one and get him down and cause Darby and sting to come down, which they did, but it looked so weak. It was so bad. The phony looking punches, the phony looking kicks, and I don't even understand what the, that these guys these days don't understand about how to get heat on somebody in the ring, how to attack them, how to make the people, how to create urgency and jeopardy. <clears throat> it's not by just kneeling down next to somebody and just throwing these windmill punches that come in some cases in close proximity to the head or face, in some cases the shoulder, the back, and they're just throwing, there's no, when guys are, kicking and stomping and dropping elbows. There's, there's supposed to be noise on the ring and you boom, boom, boom. And it creates the subliminal impression. You see the noise and the motion and the violence. And this is just somebody having a kid's tantrum on top of a fucking guy who's just covering up. And it looked weak and it took you out of it visually. So then Sting and Darby come down and they start the comeback, and then Punk comes up and starts fighting back, and then we're back to fucking oomph, because Punk backs the guy up in the corner and gives him ambidextrous, ambifistrous punches. Boom, good-looking ones in the corner. Boom, he's got fire. He's got emotion. Then they all set up and give all three of their finishes, and I'll talk about this in a second. Uh, but Punk did the go-to-sleep thing, and then. Sting gets the microphone after they've shit canned the heels and does the average Sting promo. It was so so, and the ending was kind of flat. But it got Darby Allen and Punk to be face to face and nose to nose. What's going to happen? It was a good deal in conception and not execution because, as I said, the heels were no threat. They they were supposed to be just fodder. But their shit looked so weak that, and Punk had to sell it like it was good to be down. That was the point. They got him down. 
They didn't give him anything to sell where he should have been down. It looked like shit. Sting's promo was eh. Because Sting's promos are usually eh. It didn't hurt Punk, but it didn't help him. What did you think about it before I tell you what I would have done? I thought Punk did a good promo. I have liked 2.0 and Daniel Garcia, but I agree with your overall point. They've been involved in everything. They've been involved in main event stuff from the moment they got there in terms of Moxley, Darby, Punk, guys at the top of the card, top baby faces. And nothing against them. They've been good. But why all of a sudden are they in this position? And their work doesn't hold it up. I'm not going to say that because I think their work has been fine, but they're new. They're I'm, in the company. No, I'm, I'm not talking about having matches. We're talking about drawing money now. If you can't get in the ring and kick shit out of a baby face, if you're a heel in a believable way, then you ain't going to draw any money. Well, their matches have been all right. And I just don't know why they've been so involved in everything. And I like them. I'm a fan of what I've seen so far. Darby and Sting walking broodingly to the ring. That was another thing. I hated it when the big show had to walk to the ring slowly to save the Shivani family. And then this time, Pug's getting beaten up by three guys, so Sting and Darby have to get there, but running's out and, of the question. And waited for their music. Running is out of the question, and that's what I was about to hit on. This has become a big AEW problem. Everyone's music hits every time they come out. No one runs out without their music. The music hits, and it's becoming a real crutch. And it was on this show, actually. But that's, you know, the thing that, I don't care if 2.0 2 can have some good matches with some people, then let them, and let them get a little more over, and let people think of them in a better, but all of a sudden, just everything, but especially with Punk. But they, like you said, they've been in everything, but especially with Punk. No, you didn't need the top main event heels because you needed them to be fodder in this instance, but their shit needed to look good because now you're fucking with punk and you're fucking with punk's aura. And so that was the problem. What I would have done to be quite honest with you, since they've been presented as somewhat feckless and ineffective uh, up till now, team Taz. Why the fuck couldn't Ricky Starks powerhouse Hobbs and hook have benefited from being involved in the first physical interaction that CM Punk had. <clears throat> and now you say, well, they're doing something else. Well, they're making all this shit up anyway. So why couldn't they have had some flimsy reason, Starks especially, to come out and confront, say, but they want to get over, they want to be in the main event, Team Taz, blah, blah, blah. Point is, if you had Starks and Hook and Hobbs come out and tackle the motherfucker, and let Punk fight back a little more, and he bumps fucking hot Hook, and he bumps fucking Starks, and then he turns and Hobbs catches him with those big spine busters, boom, and flattens him. And now they let Starks get on him, kicking the shit out of him, while they're standing there and fucking laughing about it, because Starks is a hell of a worker, and it's going to look good, and there's jeopardy. It's three on one, but the one guy's doing the damage. Then here comes Sting and Darby, without music, running. And Darby comes in and peels fucking Hook around and gives him that big flippy do stunner. Boom, and Hook takes a bump out. And Sting spins that fucking Hobbs around. And goddamn boom, nails him, backs him up one step, two steps, and he and Darby together double clothesline, and Hobbs goes out over the top. And now Punk has come out from under Starks, and now Punk, the only one doing shit, the setting up the three babyface finishers was a cute little moment. But it was contrived, and it took a while, and the people were up. Have fucking Punk come out from under that fucking Starks and go and give him those ten punches in the fucking quarter and bring him right out in the middle, and while Darby's watching and Sting's watching, all eyes are on Punk, and he gives Starks the go to sleep. Stark bumps out, and fucking these guys get him, and they fucking take off, and now you got the face-to-face. -face. Now you have eliminated job guys beating up CM Punk, the heat that was gotten on him would be have looked better. You still get the save. You still get excitement, but you put all the focus on CM Punk giving his finish in a wrestling ring for the first time in seven years instead of it being one of three taking place simultaneously. And then you're in the same place. And then if Sting wants to do the same interview, 
I guess that's pretty much what you're going to get because he didn't know who any of these people were before he signed for this company anyway. And he's saying shit that they've told him to say because he doesn't watch wrestling on his days off. He doesn't know what the fuck's going on. And you can tell. So what do you think about that, Brian? I think it's pretty good. I agree with you that that's something that you want the right people to get the rub from the first time Punk does something. And Team Taz has been misused. Despite the fact that they're great, despite the fact that the fans react to them, Hook has a following. He's done nothing. I agree with you. And I think based on interviews I've read, I didn't hear any of them, but I read the quotes from what Punk said. Ricky Starks is one of the guys he's looking forward to working with. Well, I guess he'll have to he'll have to be patient and wait a little while, just like he told him about Danielson. They did a package on Cage and Twinkle Toes with other people's comments about what's going to happen that I kind of zipped through. Tony Schiavone did a sit-down interview with MJF. And it wasn't really, it was, it was basically Tony introduced it and then sat back and was mute. And MJF did about a two or three minute pre-tape promo. And it, again, great material, great verbal delivery compared Jericho to Muhammad Ali in decline. Uh, they're great promos, but after two years of never winning, never producing, never making good on threats, never getting more than a week's worth of heat before they get their comeuppance, MJF and his, it does he even have a group anymore. Is that even a thing still now? That's a good is question. Is the other group, is the other group even a group anymore? That's a good question too. I don't think either of them have groups anymore. Um, the point is. Nobody believes anything he says anymore. Every week, it's a brilliant verbal performance that's totally toothless because it ain't going to happen. And the only time he does win is when 16 other people interfere and cheat, and then he picks the bones. He's never done anything on his own. He's never even done anything like a traditional heel would do by cheating by himself. And Jericho, later on in his interview which we'll get to in a second, he mentions that MJF has beaten him three times. And I don't know that I've ever seen in the history of wrestling anybody do a better job of covering up somebody's victories in people's memories <laughs> than because what do you remember? Chris Jericho flushed MJF's head in the fucking toilet. He's got three victories over Jericho, but it never happens at the end. It never happens when it's meaningful. It never happens on, on MJF's own terms. It's always a fluke, and it's immediately overshadowed the following week by Jericho's journey to get revenge, and he's Don Quixote tilting at windmills, and everybody's paying attention to him, and nobody even remembers. I mean, this is brilliant. It's like Shawn Michaels set this playbook up. Except Michaels wouldn't have done those jobs to begin with, but Jericho's managed to do them, and nobody even remembers them at this point. So, this was a great interview for this match that's coming up on a pay per view. That my God, are they really going to foist off on us Jericho beating MJF in the end again after they did that six week fucking hoo ha? to make him to supposedly get MJF over and put heat on him and give Jericho an out that he won all the other challenges, but he lost against MJF that no good prick. Oh, but wait, there's more. I'm gonna come back next month and I'll beat him. Cause if we don't beat him, then this it's, <laughs> there's no reason to have this match. He just tapped MJF, just tapped Jericho out. So why would they have another match? Unless Jericho is going to get his win back. If I'm wrong, then we've got to sit and listen to Jericho scream on commentary at a five-man booth every week. But that, And that's the, the gist of this is not that Jericho will leave the company in shame if he loses. He'll just start doing color. So he'll get the same amount of money and doesn't have to get beat up. Maybe he'll throw the match. He'd be better doing the commentary. No. No, I'm saying better for him. Don't have to take the bumps. Get paid the same. <laughs> I think he's going to, like a, a, a loser leave town match in Tupelo, Mississippi. I believe he's going to take a dive, Jericho. 
it just it doesn't make sense. What did you think about this interview and why are we even having it? I don't know how much I should say here versus the Chris Jericho promo. I'll just say MJF, no surprise to anyone, great promo. I'm a little sick of Tony Schiavone's hamming it up. He's so disgusted with MJF that while he's sitting there, he has to make faces and stuff. Petulance. Calm down, Tony. Well, ever since he got those diamond earrings put in his ears, he's he's all with the he's with the kids. A good promo. I mean, look, we've never you can never take anything away from his promo. That's not the problem with this whole feud. And the only thing I'll say, actually, I will say one thing about the promo. You ever see the video of Joan Jett doing Crimson and Clover with the Black Arts? Yes. And she always knows the camera to turn to. As yes. soon as it's time to turn, she yes. turns to the camera. It was a little too much of MJF knew exactly the moment the other camera was ready for him. Yeah. Too, too because, smooth for me. Well, if you're following the tally lights, there's a bit of a lag. But he was starting to do the turn before yeah. the camera was switching, which indicates he's got a floor director giving him the signal. So, And that indicates that the crew is working with him. Yeah, 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 yeah. I see what you're saying. But look, fantastic promo. Can't take anything away from his promo. We'll we'll save that for taking things away from his pay-per-view match. Next on the program, My Little Dog Pockets competed against Jack Evans. The same show that gave you FTR and CM Punk now presents Mascot versus Meth Head. It's just embarrassing. This again... They claim they have so much talent that they can't get it all on television. And we see MJF wrestle once every blue moon and we see FTR every three months, but pockets is on all the time. And they put Drek like this on after a CM Punk segment. So if they did catch some regular wrestling viewers that haven't watched wrestling in a few years and might all oh, punks back, they're going to look at this. They did an afterbirth with all of Hardy's guys, all those various heels fighting Jungle Boy and Dino Douche and Dwarf Dong Sucker and the new good buddies or good friends or best friends or they're minus Trent now. But they've got He it, just slid when were you to just slid right in? Who's Trent? What Trent? And, and and they're suddenly lifelong good friends, but at least they don't hug anymore. I haven't seen them hug in a while with the weird camera movement when they hug. Um. Then, there, well, here's Jericho's interview, so you can say some of these things now. And explain this to me. Jim Ross is in the ring. He even mentions in the prelude of this, this is the first Live in-ring interview I've done since I've been in AEW, and I can't think of anybody better to start than this man, Chris Jericho, and the music, and the singing, and out comes Jericho. And Jericho has his own microphone, and they stood there in the ring talking to each other from, did you see, from at least 10 feet away from each other, like the, somebody was contagious. There was no in-ring interview. JR introduced him. <laughs> Can I guess which one was contagious? Well, I uh, was because it had just have been his vodka breath or what? Um, <laughs> which one? <laughs> uh, no. Oh, come on. <laughs> Talking about Jericho COVID. Uh, but no, seriously. And JR said something and then backed up to the corner. And Jericho did the whole rest of the fucking promo. But JR is there for an in-ring interview. We just saw a classic example of how it can be done. Tony Schiavone just in-ring interviewed CM Punk the other night and they with one microphone and it went perfectly. But now they bring JR in the ring, announce it's his first in-ring interview that he's done in the company. He brings out Jericho. Jericho's got his own mic. They never get closer than 10 feet away from each other. And Jim Ross spends most of the time back in the corner after asking maybe one question or making one observation, and Jericho does the whole thing. What sense did that make? I, 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 Looking for sense in anything Chris Jericho has done since the beginning of 2020 would be a fruitless mission. And he did a good promo. Jericho can talk. But uh, once again, if if he hadn't brought up now that it... And that's another reason I believe that he's going to beat the shit out of MJF this weekend because he wouldn't have brought up that he'd done three jobs in a promo about this final, final match unless he was going to win it. And I said, my God, he's beaten Jericho three times and they've still managed to make MJF look like he's never won anything in people's minds. It's, uh, 
it, it, that's why I, I wrote it was it the swirly or is it always the immediate last word or comeback or something that Jericho gets and anyway to Jericho tearfully bid goodbye in case he has to go all the way over to the commentary desk thank you all for everything if I have to walk 15 feet away and talk for a living instead of bumping there's no there's nothing on the line here nobody's rioting in the streets for Jericho to continue wrestling to begin with don't let him stop we're not hearing that and it ain't going to happen anyway but it's it's the, <laughs> the baby face has has it all on the line if i lose i'll lose my championship and be forced to leave the the company if i lose i'll be I'll have my head shaved. I'll be embarrassed in front of everybody in the middle of the ring. If I lose, I'll be thrown into a, a pit of piranhas. If I lose, I can't wrestle anymore on this show. I'll have to do color. You talk about this interview. This interview, this program, there's so much to say. Jericho did a good fired up interview. Can't take that away from him. I thought him and Jim Ross at different times were going to try to pretend like they were crying, which was interesting being emotional over this. I want to take a step back. Jericho did a program with Orange Cassidy. Taking your feelings for Orange Cassidy out of the equation. Pretend he's just Wrestler X. Wrestler X was getting some attention. He was moving some numbers. He was selling a lot of merch. Jericho worked a program with him. It was ridiculous, but on the other side of it, Jericho put him over. What he's done since then has been nothing, but Jericho put him over to end the feud, which was probably what he should do for a young guy, Orange Cassidy or not. So here we have MJF. I remember you and I talking on the air early on when the numbers first started coming in that the three guys that were moving the numbers the most, they weren't the Bucks or Omega, it wasn't Cody. It was, no surprise, Jericho, Moxley, and MJF from the very beginning, and he's been great on that show. I got to believe somewhere along the way, Jericho, who is smart enough to know what to leech onto, and he really has become just a wrestling leech, which is you know, probably what explains the bloated Jericho look. He's sucking all the blood from the young wrestlers in the fucking business, which is what he did to fucking MJF. And I'm sure he sold it to MJF and sold it to Tony on how he's going to put this kid over big. This kid's the next big star. He's going to can't wait to work with him. We'll put him over. And from the very beginning, this feud was handled. This feud, them together as a unit into the feud has been the worst booked major program in AEW history. He was MJF was the the little flunky that was now under the control of the big star in the group. Then when he planned to take over the group, it backfired on him, but he had fucking another group waiting. What would have happened if that first group had said, yeah, fuck Jericho. But he had another group waiting, and then they promptly got the shit kicked out of them, and he got flushed in the toilet. And then they've been on the football field, and they've, they've been on the crash pads, and they've been on whatever. There but been always, in every instance... MJF and or the people he was aligned with have been portrayed or have come off as fucking goofy and ineffectual. And ineffective. Ineffective. And, you know... Don't grammar police me. No, I'm adding to what you said. I'm adding on to what you said. I thought ineffectual or ineffective. And right? ineffective. I, I said and, and ineffective. ineffective. Well, there's, there's all kinds of feckless, ineffectual, ineffective... All of those things were. There were moments during this feud that were good. If various things were reordered in a different order, things may have made more sense and been better. But the one thing you could think about while all this stupidity is going on, and guys like MJF and FTR and Santana and Ortiz, talented guys are being dragged down with this bad Jericho shit. The one thing you could think is, at the other side of this, MJF is going to get a victory. And that sets him up for whatever's next. And I went through all those labors of Jericho and turned into the labors of me watching that show. 
And we got to the point where MJF got his victory. I forgot that was the third time. I thought that was the time. Got his victory. It seemed, it felt like everything was over. But then they dragged it back out. And now the stipulation. A retirement stipulation where you're afraid to say the word retirement. What the fuck is that? <laughs> I will never wrestle again here, but I may be somewhere else, but not here. Just say you're going to retire. Why wouldn't you just say you're going to retire? So we have two options right now. The one option is that Chris Jericho, in his last bit of stupidity with this program, has the right intention and is going to, for the fourth time, put over Maxwell Jacob Friedman and then go on tour with Fozzie, spreading diseases all across the country. MJF is prepared for who knows what's next. Brian Danielson? Him and Cody, I think, still have unfinished business. There's lots of things. Maybe that's what Jericho has in mind. Or maybe the guy that you may remember several years ago, I talked about how ridiculous it was him getting the win over AJ at WrestleMania, AJ Styles, when AJ was the hot thing, just coming to WWE. And some people went to Vince and may have said, hey, uh, you know, maybe I want to win here <laughs> at WrestleMania. <laughs> we talked about that a few years ago. If Chris Jericho beats MJF at that pay-per-view, this is one of the worst jobs a veteran has ever done in the history of the business, screwing over a younger talent. If after all of this, the outcome is Jericho getting a big victory to then disappear for months, that is the biggest bunch of bullshit. Or even not to disappear. And Tony Khan, who is one of the biggest Chris Jericho marks out there, should know better. You've let him do all this shit, Tony. If you let him beat MJF at that pay-per-view, that's on your hands. Because it's one of the stupidest things ever. And I'm going to give MJF some advice. Come out on TV the next week and say, look, it's Yom Kippur. God closes the book. I'm on to, I may never be able to go on to bigger things, but I could go on to better things. <laughs> Chris Jericho, L'Chaim, I'm on to bigger and better things. But seriously, this has been bullshit. This whole feud sucked. It's dragged MJF and Wardlow and FTR. I don't give a shit about Spears. I forgot about Wardlow. Has Wardlow been around lately? Is he still with MJF? I think, right? I Maybe. Have, I, have, I haven't seen him uh, in a way. He wasn't on this sit down. But just what a, what a waste. I'm confident in MJF. MJF is a brilliant talker. We've seen what he could do in the ring when he actually gets to do something in the ring. And he is... A perfect mix of old school sensibilities with a modern wrestling flair so that the audiences today really like him. I have confidence that he will be able to, whoever he works with next, turn it on and make people forget about this year. But this is going to be like for him, that year that fucking, um, what's his name, left Dallas, Bobby Ewing. And then all of a sudden, Bobby <laughs> Ewing, yeah. he's in the shower at the end of the year. It was all a dream. This was all just a fucking nightmare. But it's coming to an end. One way or another, it has to be coming to an end. But, Jim, what do you think? My thoughts are, maybe Jericho, misguided, stupidly, will think, what a great way to put him over. Four wins. Or, does Jericho really have the unprofessional balls to take the victory from MJF when the whole feud should be centered around him getting that victory coming out of it? I think he's got the balls. <laughs> I think he's going to fucking beat him. You hadn't watched. I'll be glad to admit I was wrong next week. I think he's going to win this match, and then that'll be the end of Jericho and MJF. Should Tony and then MJF that? can go, well, no, of course not. Here's the thing. A lot of people are going to say, well, all through history in wrestling, the good guy is supposed to win in the end, and et cetera, et cetera. Yes, the whole idea of wrestling since the dawn of wrestling has been to make the people want to see the babyface win in the end and then give them that. Except when the babyface has seldom been in jeopardy, the only jeopardy Jericho's been in is manufactured jeopardy when he does another one of his stunts that is supposed to attract more attention to him. Oh, I fell off a 30-foot fucking deal. That's what, that was one of the wins, by the way, that MJF got. It was, it was designed so everybody would remember the fall that Jericho took and not the result of the match. There's always something that where people's minds are on Jericho, not on what actually happened. And 
you know, so you've either got to, in every John Wayne movie, the heels burned his cabin down and shot his horse and raped his wife and did, he never got shit until the end. Then he got, he fucked everybody up. It's the same thing in every story. The heel has to build the heat for the baby face to make the comeback. There has been no heat building. There was a moment that, oh, this will get big heat. And then the next month or the next week, the guy gets his head flushed in the toilet. MJF has not gone on a rampain, a rampain, a rain or a rampage of terror to where people were, oh my God, can anybody stop him? Like all the great heels in every fucking territory and every company in wrestling. Oh, can anybody stop him? Finally, this guy does. No. He hasn't been on a reign of terror. He's been on a reign of great promos and not producing anything. So nobody believes what he says. And sometimes the babyface doesn't win in the end if you're trying to pass any kind of a torch. That's when the heel gets his 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 word is the final word and you give the baby face that put him over some good reason to be distracted and go in another direction. And then it doesn't bury the baby face. This is none of those things. Anyway, speaking of baby faces, Darby Allen, can they put his picture on tranquilizers? He should get a, a, uh, a, to be as exciting as he is in the ring. And when you see him physically and he's flying around everywhere, he did a promo package. He sits there and kind of mumbles, almost put some bass in his voice in one line and then went back to mumbling and barely even looks up or looks at the camera, just sits there and talks kind of like this. Is uh, There's not much oomph to him. Can there be a bigger, disparity between all the action you see in the ring and his just paint drying fucking method of speaking am i just being too hard on the boy maybe i mean look he's not mr promo but that's kind of his thing his whole thing is that whole you know brooding skateboarder depressed guy i mean he's not gonna be like out there cm punk i'm gonna get you like that's just not him what do you i mean He's different than everyone else. I would think there's always been people in the world depressed, but I never saw any of them in the wrestling business, at least on camera. And again, I said that word. You know, that's the way I perceive the well, Darby I mean, Allen no, the, the whole the whole brooding kind of you know thing that the the skateboarding thing, as you said, the whatever. There's, I never looked at that. Well, there's a goddamn person I need to pay to see. 50 years of television people had to be entertaining and up and witty or smart or lively or whatever it's not you don't just watch tv to watch people sit there and go well i don't know i don't know <sighs> anyway um i see now why christian cage is speaking for some of the baby face because jungle boy has a little bit of that as well he's so exciting in the ring and he talks like a fucking bucket of mud powerhouse hobbs okay we're gonna get powerhouse willie hobbs in a single match i can't wait to see this i couldn't wait for the first 20 seconds as he was coming down the ramp until brian cage out of nowhere just tackles him halfway down the ramp and and jump starts the thing and that useless corpse referee that looks like a one of Baron von Raschke's wasted sperms. Rick Knox stood there on the floor and watched Cage beat the shit out of Hobbs on the floor and bash him into the railing back and forth and did absolutely nothing. And then he throws Hobbs in the ring and gets in the ring and, and the referee just rings the bell to start the match. Like, okay. And they think they're actually, they even call attention. Well, the referee hadn't started the match yet to make sure the people know, well, he shouldn't be counting them out because they're on the floor because the match hadn't started yet. No, it just looks even phonier and faker because the referee is standing there doing nothing. And then when the one of the guys is at a horrible disadvantage, then he rings the bell because that's fair. Whether it's the heel or the baby face, either one is fucking God damn it. Anyway, 
finally Hobbs took over and started to get some heat and they went to the break. <laughs> so in the commercial, I guess Hobbs is getting some steam on Cage. They come back and Hobbs is kicking the shit out of Cage. Hobbs is a future superstar. He's got everything. If he gets somewhere where he can work with good talent and get proper instruction, he's a million-dollar guy. The way that he's moving around, the way he's picked up on this already, just the way he looks. But Cage, his selling is the shits. He's so robotic in his movements that it made Hobbs look like shit and drug the match down, in my opinion. And even when Cage uncorks some of his flippy-do stuff, it's not like a guy actually being in a match. It's like a guy going out there and doing flips and or performing moves. And it's obvious that he's doing it at the same pace, the same speed and or the guys helping him or whatever. It just cage is just, he's just, his boots are in fucking mud. Even when he's moving fast, he still looks see-through. I don't know. It's like trying to have a match with one of those stand-up punching dummies, right? The, the, the top half is a human being, but the bottom half is the thing with sand filled in it. You can't knock it over. He's just a fucking robot. And finally, Ricky Starks from out of nowhere hit Cage in the head with the title belt and Hobbs power slammed him. I just, I'd love to see Hobbs against anybody else but Brian Cage. What'd you think? I agree with you. Hobbs was impressive. I love Taz on commentary. Hook, for someone who does nothing, I'm okay with him. Like, the fans seem to be into him at ringside. <laughs> it's the hair getting heat. I don't think we're ever going to see him work a match. I'm convinced of that. But there's something about him that I get a kick out of. Ricky Starks is great. Cage does all the moves that the Bucks crew does. But like you said, maybe it's because he's so bulky or what, but he looks like he's doing it in slow motion at times. I didn't like this match because I'm not a big fan. The more I see a Brian Cage, the less I want to see a Brian Cage. The more I see yeah. Powerhouse Hobbs, the more I want to see him do something, but kind of ready for them to do something else with Team Taz. I've been ready for a while, but for real, do something yeah. else. They're really, Taz is so fucking talented on a mic. He's one of the best guys there on the mic. He's one of the best guys there on commentary. Ricky Starks has been great. Hobbs has as much potential as anyone there. As much potential as anyone that people throw the term potential at. Like a Jungle Boy who may have a ceiling that a Will Hobbs doesn't. Well, and I agree because Jungle Boy, and we've said this before, if he had started in a good training program and got the fucking picture, he's an excellent worker when he's having a wrestling match. But he gets into too many of the spot fests with the goofs, and he's more comfortable doing that now than he is actually having real matches. And it's hurt him. And with the size thing, he's a great underdog and a great babyface, sympathetic babyface you want to root for. But he's got to figure out how to talk and get him a personality. How do these guys ever fucking get pussy if they can't talk and tell stories and have a line of bullshit? On Tinder. Down to, say it again? They use apps to meet women. Oh, good Lord. Hey, anyway. I'm in Atlanta for a day. What are you doing? So, oh, God damn it. Anyway, um, but the same thing is, is that uh, Jungle Boy will have a, a ceiling of some description because of the size and if he doesn't learn how to talk, whereas Hobbs in five years could be main event in WrestleMania. You don't have any idea. Because he's got unlimited potential if he doesn't learn too many bad fucking habits. Anyway, uh, Malachi Black, the promo package. He's got the spookiness. He's got the cards. He's going to put coins on his opponent's eyes to pay the boatman's bill, the toll. I love that shit. Don't pay the ferryman until he gets you to the other side, by the way. Who was that? Jerry and the Pacemakers. Oh, come on. No, that's very <laughs> across the mercy. <laughs> I wanted to see if I'd pop you with that one. Don't pay the ferryman until he gets you to the other side. Don't pay the ferryman. Da -da -da. You don't remember that? I don't remember that. All right. Well, I wish I could remember the fucking guy's name. Who was it? God damn it. Who sings 
What's type, the name it, of the t- type it in now. Don't pay the ferryman. I'm going to hate myself that I can't remember this goddamn name. Help me. Here it is. Don't pay the don't pay the ferryman by Krista Berg. Krista Berg, who also did the lady in red. Yeah. But don't pay the ferryman's a very under uh, underappreciated tune. Very spooky atmospheric thing. I prefer Jerry and the pacemakers. Don't let the sun oh. catch you crying. Ferry across the mercy. I prefer I that, like it. I prefer that duet that Michael jo- Jackson and Elton John were gonna do. Don't let your sun go down on me. Oh, come on. See, that's so inappropriate. All right. All right. What, what's what? coming? Malachi did a good promo. What's next? Malachi did a good promo. <laughs> you know, they were trying right before Michael, Michael Jackson died. They were trying to do a sponsorship with him and, and McDonald's. They were going to do a McMichael sandwich. That's a 40-year-old piece of meat in between two 10-year-old buns. But anyway, next That's up. awful. Come on. We had QT Marshall. By the way, how many sandwich jokes do you have? Because I've always said this. I remember you appearing on Adelphi University's radio, Dave the Pile Driver Schwartz's show. <laughs> I remember you doing a promo in the 90s saying, you're eating a Pee Wee Herman sandwich. That's a Reuben. Hold the pickle. Yeah. And now you have another sandwich joke about another disgraced Another guy went down in the early 90s with a big uh, scandal. A lot of my food jokes <laughs> are, you know, I have jokes about food, but also more jokes about Pee Wee Herman besides food. You know, the Pee Wee Herman, after that whole kerfluffle, he wanted to act as his own attorney because he was convinced he could get himself off. <laughs> you just said that one recently. So. All right. Nevertheless, <laughs> ah, QT Marshall and his group. <laughs> The joke continues. Came out to the ring. <laughs> yeah. QT Marshall walks into a bar and if people say, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> the bar closed. Yeah, the bar closes. <laughs> Can you please leave? We want to start happy hour. QT Marshall uh, walked into a bar. The bar that took a nap. <laughs> uh, anyway, he called out the big show and out comes the big show with his new non big show music. Well, it's not the big show. And the heels, there's five heels in the ring, and they just swarm him, because why wouldn't they? And he shoves them all off and punches QT and shit cans the other ones, because they're showing he's a giant. All right, if we have to see Big Show versus QT Marshall, this hadn't been bad so far. And then here comes Billy Gunn and his two sons, Austin Gunn and Colton Gunn, known as the Gun Club. And they hit the ring and they back show up. You know, they're standing there with him and it's now it's the three of them plus Big Show against the five or six heels or whatever. And there's the stare down and then Billy Gunn just holds off and hits the Big Show in his bad hip with a chair. Boom and down he goes. And then I was like, what the fuck? And then he hits Show in the head. And and within seconds, excrement has hurt his wall. Well, damn Billy Gunn and his scumbag sons. <laughs> Within five seconds after he hit the guy with a chair, his, scu- his sons have turned into scumbags in the eyes of the... And they didn't do anything. But we used to like these people, but now we don't. And why did they do that? We don't know. But now does QT's group have nine people in it? Austin Gunn, Colton Gunn, Billy Gunn, as well as Somo, Coromato, Agogo, whatever the fuck. <laughs> and the two other clowns that he's got tagging a lot what is this i don't know why any of this is getting on tnt it belongs on youtube despite the fact that it's the fucking big show who's a big star qt marshall qt marshall and i just so then i just the- don't think anyone gives a shit and then the other thing is if you thought the qt big show feud was bad Let's get Big Show and Billy Gunn and family in 2021. Are you kidding me? Well, that's what I'm trying to figure out here. And and then the guns leave the ring and QT and his guys get back in the ring and they pick Big Show up and hold him up so that QT can give the Big Show a diamond cutter. And they leave Big Show laying. Do they honestly think that that is going to get any type of want to see this heat? on QT Marshall or anybody in that group, or do they just think the people are going to be like, well, now big shows getting beat up by these fucking clowns. I don't care who Paul White was going to work with at the pay-per-view QT or someone else. This was not a good way to set it up. 
There's, it means nothing. He's just wrestling a match against someone no one gives a shit about. And not, this, at the last minute, Billy Gunn. AEW superstar Billy Gunn turning on Paul White. No one cares. Out of all the things you could have done to have the AEW wrestling debut of the former Big Show, who is a star, this was a complete waste. Or put him in there with a young guy that could use the elevation of some sort. Actually, not even that. No, show is not at the point, nor does he need to be at the point where he's elevating young guys. He's not going to go in there and have a fucking... but not Rip by losing a 20 minute match That's what I'm winning saying. or losing working with I'm saying as a tag team partner if you had him as someone like Darby's oh, okay. tag team partner I'll buy that then it puts Darby over because he's standing on the apron with someone who's a young uh, and I'm, that may not be the perfect fit but you get my point well, it's, it's Darby Allen looks like one of Big Show's fucking toes and that's a, and that's exactly what you want with a giant you want someone who's tagging with him that's really small it makes him look even bigger he'll look gigantic in that AEW ring but I agree with tag team match yes young partner help triumph whatever but for a single match which is what they apparently were dead set on having get some get a little fucking weasel or even a manager or somebody and not the brandon cutlets or michael knock it offs but you have to have some little we you know what the first match for big show on pay-per-view if they'd have done it right would have been great to be against mjf because if MJF had been running that mouth with nobody shutting it up for about six or eight months, and then finally he got wangled into a one-on-one confrontation with the big show, that's when that works. You bring the giant back to have a six-minute match where he kicks a teetotal shit out of some little guy with a lot of heat. Then that might be an attraction. But is But just to have the big show return against basically a no-name person who's has no cachet in the wrestling business and has a group of guys that nobody's ever heard of and now they're doing angles where they're getting heat on the giant fuck he don't need to be having good matches anymore at this stage of his career he's valuable the big show once every year or so you put him in a situation where he's in there for a short time and gets shit done but i i don't know what the fuck this is there are too many guys in AEW who are on the show. Whatever you want to do with anyone on YouTube, do whatever the fuck you want. There are too many people getting on the nationally televised show that don't belong. And it doesn't feel right. QT and his crew don't belong there. Matt Hardy and his crew don't belong there. There's just too many of these groups where it's not just who one are Matt, person. What has Matt Hardy done? To deserve this, they bring him in, they give him brain damage, they bash his face in last week, they injure him, they put him with mismatched and miscellaneous jobbers to go out and do the stupidest things that have been perpetrated, and what the fuck? That's, I mean, I know that Nick Cage there for a while, you know, he had to take any role that he was offered because he was in tax trouble, but how the mighty have fallen here. And again, going back to just using them as the example, you mean to tell me Paul White doing all of this with Team Taz wouldn't have been better? There you go. Anybody. You, you could slide Team Taz into anything else that's happening in AEW <laughs> with a faction and it would automatically be better. Uh, and it'd be better than what they're doing now. Anyway, uh, Tony had an interview with Britt Baker and Reba and their new sidekick, Jamie, and Britt has signed a new contract. And boy, she's just rolling those promos off her tongue these days. She had just, it, it's, Remember, I thought they were crazy, and they were actually crazy, when they put her out there the first week as a heel and just left her twisting in the wind and it was so bad it was good, but I felt so bad for her. She got it, and she didn't take long, and now she's the goddamn, she's the golden voice of AEW. But then from the penthouse to the outhouse, Penelope Ford with Bunny took on Ty Conti. Twelve minutes later, Officer Bar Brady is with Thunder Rosa. And I thought I was safe because I said, okay, I've managed to skip past Penelope Ford and Ty Conti and the Bunny Rabbit, and I'm with Thunder Rosa. I'm in good hands here. And she says maybe two words, and here comes Vicky Guerrero 
Nyla Rose, Jane Cargill, and the fake lawyer. And they proceeded to get into the most stagey, phony, awkward fight that I have ever seen on any professional wrestling program. This was embarrassed. I can't, was it live? Because if it was pre-taped, they need to fire the producer. Unless he said, we can't show this. And somebody said, oh, yes, we can. Otherwise, he needs to be standing in a bread line. I, d I can't believe that anybody that's been in wrestling more than five minutes would have said, not said, hey, we, we can't, we can't show this. Did you see it? I watched it, yeah. And then after they all beat Thunder Rosa up, then they, the rest of them looked at each other and just started talking to each other over the top of her body. And the cameraman's not doing anything and nobody's running in and, and she's just as Thunder Rosa's having to sell down there like she's had the shit kicked out of her. While they're just having a discussion, standing over the top of her, and even the the, the announcers, everybody's left, and it just the, the it's like the cameraman is under instructions. You're you're covering the war in Vietnam. Don't get involved. Just shoot what you see. And did I mention how fake every bit of physical activity looked leading up to this? The phony award winner goes to. I can't believe they aired it. I, am I being too hard on it? Maybe. I mean, it came out of that awful match. I don't know. The women's, no, I mean, the just, women's actually, division is a Just what you saw. Just what you saw. Was that the phoniest looking shit that you've ever seen? It was ridiculous. Wrestling? Thunder Rosa was there. She was about to cut a good promo, and all of a sudden she's surrounded from all sides. Without anyone noticing anything, that seemed to happen a but lot. But just the though. physical contact, or lack of it, and just the stagey manner, it was like it was like a sketch comedy show was doing a sketch about wrestling. And Thunder Rosa is so good. Anyway, that's the problem. AEW legitimately has some really super talented women's wrestlers. Thunder Rosa, Britt Baker as a personality in the ring, I think there's still. She was. Well, she's better than the a lot of she's the. She's better than the a field. lot of them there. Yeah, Serena D. Serena she's got D. an injury, but she's she's off right now. But hopefully she'll be back soon. You know, it'll be interesting to see how the next couple of years go. If they get some more really talent, if a Charlotte Flair ends up there, if other really talented women end up there, you've got some good building blocks. You got some good foundation pieces there that you know you could put in the ring and have a good match. Can you imagine if they had Charlotte Flair and Britt Baker? Those those people would boo Charlotte Flair out of the building. They would love Britt Baker even more than they do already. They'd have some fucking. They'd ha you'd be able to draw money with a women's match in this company with something like that. Not with the Japanese fetish objects. So that's where old Twinkle Toes, I'm sure, will throw his body in between any competent women wrestlers uh, signing on onto this roster because it will further diminish his pet project which is to get every outlaw girl who embarrasses the wrestling business in the country of japan a job with an american billionaire speaking of a job with an american billionaire the main event at least they didn't start out the show like i had i could enjoy well not enjoy i could watch the rest of the show in peace and quiet then we get at the end, the eight-man tag team match with Jungle Boy and Dino Douche and the Lucha Brothers with Dwarf Dong Sucker against the Hardly Boys and the No Good Brothers with their managers, Don Fallis and Brandon Cutlet. And this was the last, what, 15, 20 minutes of the show? And it was the same as always. I watched for a few seconds and my mind wandered and I started doing notes on the rest of this program and every time i'd look up there was some other ridiculous gyration or gymnastics exhibition going on or somebody throwing jungle boy in a flip off onto 15 people to catch him they're not capable of having a fucking match of any other kind so for 15 minutes this was just basically movement back and forth for no reason 
Twinkle Toes. Did you see Twinkle Toes? Now his hair is dyed jet black. He looked like Crowbar. He looks just like Devin Storm. Too bad he can't work like Crowbar. But now he is, he's, it looked like a, it was Bill Dundee black. It was so black lightning bugs follow it around in the daytime. It was blacker than a banker's heart. Have I mentioned how black, I saw dwarf stars crashing into Twinkle Toes' head. That's how black his hair was. Have I mentioned how black it was? Dwarf stars, you say. Dwarf, star, <laughs> dwarf stars coming in because of the black hole that was generated by. See, so you got to have an astronomy background. So they had this match. I don't know what the fuck happened. I can't remember who won. I wasn't paying any attention because, as I mentioned, it was repetitious bullshit. But then Twinkle Toes came out with his hair dyed black. They dropped the cage. They had the cage hanging over the ring even though there was no cage match they wanted to show what the cage looked like if you're going to buy the pay-per-view on on sunday and they did another one of these long fake self-indulgent circle jerks that lasted forever and that nobody cares about where all of the elite heels just beat up the baby faces beyond all reason while they were in the cage and and tony shivani had a shoot comment i don't think he meant it that way but he said this is beyond horrible yes it was uh and did was i imagining things or were the people in chicago standing there going when will this bullshit be over with and making very little noise about it yeah i noticed that too it reminded me of late era nwo being booked by 1990 ole anderson there you go. That cage. The cage is what made me think of Ole. And then I was like, yeah, you know, the booking of the Bucks in the main event here is not that dissimilar to how to misbook the horseman under Ole Anderson. This fucking went on forever. This was bad. And I'll just say it here. I was just going to say it before. You said it wasn't the worst show. I thought this was a horrible episode of AEW Dynamite, specifically a horrible go home show to the pay per view. This didn't make me want to see Omega and the Bucks at the pay per view. It oh, made God, me not want no. to see them again. See, you're, you've, you've misunderstood my, you misrepresented my comment, Brian. I said, this wasn't the worst show I've ever seen. I didn't say it was any good. It certainly wasn't anything that would make people want to buy the pay-per-view, except because CM Punk is on it. But uh, at least they had one wrestling match with the wrong winner and a good promo until the job guys kind of fucked that up. But, but no, that's the, th it's the, it's like they have watched wrestling television from the past. I'm talking about Twinkle Toes and Callus and the Hardly Boys. And they imitate things that the main event guys did in the last segments of those shows that they've watched in the past. And so they do it, but they don't do it as well. And it takes longer and it's not set up as well. And it just goes on forever. And these people in Chicago, the AEW fans, were starting to not give a flying fuck. And and I've been saying this for two years. The more you see of these guys with clear eyes and not being under the influence of some mass hypnosis or whatever, but the more you watch old Twinkle Toes, the more you watch the Hardly Boys, the more you've seen them because they do the same shit over and over. And it's not good to begin with. So this was another one of those things. They just beat the baby faces up forever and acted like people were mad at them. And everybody was standing there going, ah, oh, fuck, more of this. The lack of reaction has been, I said that last week, I think, that whenever they've had these tag team matches to set up the cage match at the pay-per-view and the Bucks come out and get their entrance after the teams have been announced, I thought the lack of reaction, the lack of booze, the lack of anything was telling. And I thought the same thing here. And well, the longer Omega was on that mic <laughs> and the longer the endless beat down that no one really cared to see went on. And you, and you know what the, the, if you're right, the microphone work was making what you were seeing physically done in the ring that much worse and seemed like it was dragging that much longer because it's also so, so phony and non-genuine what he's saying at the same time. I've said it before. It's like, Tony Khan announces these matches and people want to see them. And then booking like this makes me not want to see it. 
You know, and I think that's part of the issue. They do those. What are those shows called? I forget the name of it. HBO used to do it. UFC. Where, you know, yeah. it's like professionally filmed and they do the little one-on-one -on -one interviews and they tell the story. Yeah, they're 24-7. They're 24-7. Yeah. AEW does that. They're about to do another one for this pay-per-view. I've seen their previous ones. Even the ones like with the Bucks and Omega, it's better than what they do on TV. It makes you more likely to want to see them get their ass kicked or in a match than what's on TV. I think AEW would be better served waving the last hour of the last Dynamite before a pay-per-view and just turning that whole hour over to that the countdown show it does a better job of making you want to see that pay-per-view you know the fucking why go home show you know why because now it's in the hands of the production crew and they can take certain highlights and as we all know from watching movie trailers you can make any movie look good in a trailer they can take the highlights they can write a voiceover they can make the story linear and understandable and put the highlights to it and you're like wow and it's just then when you see in one take, the unedited live performance of many of these guys, you go, oh. And that's, you know, that's the dead. They can, they can make all that shit look good in the countdown show, but then you got to have guys that can come out and carry it off. And, you know, and it's going to be interesting also because if people are already, they've been booing Cody, well, at least they're making noise. They're just, you know, mad at him as a person so he could come back as a heel. If the people are starting to see through the the Hardly Boys and Twinkle Toes and or if Punk and Danielson and potentially Cole or Charlotte or Flair, Ric Flair, whoever, Bray Wyatt, if they bring WWE fans not only to watch the television show, but shock and amazement to actually spend money by a ticket on wrestling, imagine that. And those WWE fans come into the building and they're wanting to see Bray Wyatt and they're wanting to see Brian Danielson. They're wanting to see CM Punk. But then they look at the fucking Bucks or they listen to Twinkle Toes or they see Pockets. And then are we going to start seeing Pockets of fat, no pun intended, Pockets of fans in the buildings rumbling with each other because the WWE fans are laughing at the amateur hour group that is still the favorites of these yahoos over here that supported AEW all along, and the meanwhile, the WWE stars that are actually mainstream stars and bigger level stars and more talented, they come in and start fucking outperforming the executive vice presidents and bringing their fans that are cheering for them and laughing at the other guys. Why, this could be wild! We could have fan fights. We could have the executive vice presidents fighting with the ex WWE real stars. We could have all kinds of fucking chaos. This might be good. I'm all for chaos. Why don't you guys sign Tessa and Enzo? <laughs> Let's just get everyone in there. Well, wait a minute. Now we're talking about bringing bringing stars in. Tessa would be a star. Enzo would be a. Uh, I'm just looking for the chaos. He might be one of those dwarf stars. You know, no one wants to say it, and no one wants to hear it, and I don't know why we're going to talk about it here during the AEW review, but Enzo Amore was fucking great on the microphone, and was a, he was someone who you would pay to see get his ass kicked. It's just he was a nutcase. Yeah. But I actually, not a great worker in the traditional sense, but I thought he was a great wrestling personality. But it just nobody actually wants to be around him in person for real, right? That's the only catch. Yeah, well, sometimes he worked himself into a shoot, I guess. Actually, that's that's the kind of guy that used to get into wrestling business and probably would also bounce from territory to territory very quickly, but there'd always be a new territory that he could go in that he didn't have heat with all the boys and he could be there for three months till they all wanted to kill him. And he could draw some money that way because you do want to beat the fuck out of him no matter who you are. But, oh well. And I said it to you last week, and I think in some sense you need to separate Omega and the Bucks. Because I think if it's Omega just acting like goofy Omega, inconsistent with his character from week to week, he's wearing one thing, he's wearing another, he doesn't know who he wants to be, he's got the Giuliani hair dye. If it's just that guy, and he's having matches and feuds with the likes of a Christian Cage or a Brian Danielson or whoever, I could deal with that. But the Bucks and the bad comedy and the fucking bad acting 
and coming out of there, and we'll see as more and the Stooges, the Stooges. And Which that, one's worse, part of cut, cutless, or knock it the fuck off? They're both the same. It's both meaningless bad comedy. But we'll see what happens when some fans of real stars start coming in. How they're going to react to the Young Bucks? The reaction hasn't been that good the last few weeks, and I think if you look at what's happening in AEW. Out of all the things that really feel like they're happening right now, do you think the Young Bucks and the Good Brothers are on that list? Again, I separate Omega from them. They're kind of, they suck. Well, I'll I'll separate a couple of people. I'll say this and we'll put a period on it. But personal feelings aside for individuals, as you always say, right? Putting my feelings for my little dog pockets and the Cucamonga kids and a few of these other people aside, if WWE fans in any sizable, appreciable number, a couple of thousand in the arena at, at their house shows, or a couple of hundred thousand on television, a, a number enough to move the overall needle, and that's where we're at these days. If those people who hadn't watched wrestling in six or seven years since punk has been gone and remember him from the WWE and they have no frame of reference for what's gone on over the past several years. And they hear that punk is back and they turn on the television and they see pockets or they see the bucks or a couple of other specific, you know, of these individuals, you mean to tell me that you don't think everybody isn't willing to acknowledge that those fans would laugh and go, what the fuck is this? They have children doing this now, or is this, what is this stupid? Is this comedy? Is this supposed to be a parody? Would they understand it? Even if you've been away from wrestling for six or seven years, would those people, I guess what I'm saying is, would is there any other reaction they would have, but to laugh and go, what the fuck is this? I genuinely think if a non-fan or if a lapsed fan saw Nick Jackson, it may take them a second, but they'll say, wow, this guy's pretty athletic. He seems to be doing some sort of wrestling thing in an athletic form. I think if they saw his brother, they would think, who is this ridiculous little man acting like a wrestler? That's where the dividing line is. It's, I can recognize the talent of a Nick Jackson, but boy, the act is so lame. I so don't stale. But see, here's the thing. If they haven't watched wrestling in the past six or seven years since CM Punk was around, they're not going to sit there and study just Nick Jackson to see if there's some redeeming quality about him. They're going to look at the visual that they're being presented on the surface of it and go, who are all these clowns mixing in with wrestlers? I think they'll see a Nick Jackson doing the little sequence he does with a Ray Phoenix and being impressed by that. That might be. I don't think they'll stop and start evaluating. Oh, this doesn't look like a wrestler from the past. I think the first instinct is to watch it and see it. That might be somebody who's predisposed to really liking wrestling and wanting to see it. In which case, they probably wouldn't quit watching it six or seven years ago. I think all those people that were watching the WWE when they were doing twice the numbers that they are now, a lot of them just say, "I want to see a horse stone cold. I want to see somebody kick somebody's ass. I want to see a fucking." whatever they don't want to see children and silliness and they're not going to look close enough or long enough to say oh but that guy that looks like a fucking 14 year old he really can wrestle he can do a lot of athletic stuff no they're the guy that works at the gas station where's stone cold or cena gonna come out you can't see me where's randy orton i want to see an rko out of nowhere those are all the people we lost the, the, the only ones we haven't run off yet as an industry as a whole, professional wrestling, the only ones we haven't run off yet are the ones who are smart to everything, and you will have to run them off with a fucking stick. Everybody else has said, fuck this fake bullshit. So those are the ones we need to get back if we're going to get anybody. And they want to see some stars that look like they're going to beat somebody up. That's my editorial for the day, and I refuse and have yet to be proven wrong and refuse to be proven wrong about that. Because all these guys might have some redeeming quality, but some jack-off auto repair guy in fucking Des Moines is not going to sit there and take notes on Nick Jackson's quality of his work. That's not what I was saying, though. I'm just, but no, that's not, but that's what I'm saying. 
Those people ain't going to. They've already got the other ones. Anybody that's going to recognize that Nick Jackson's a wonderful athlete for his appearance or whatever is already watching. And the people that ain't watching would tune in and see, that's why I'm not watching, because it's a bunch of fucking kids playing now. And every time that they mix their recognized stars in with wannabe children and amateurs that don't fit the fucking part, they either lose their chance at or diminish their chances at any of those people saying, well, I'll actually watch this wrestling show because Punk and Danielson and Bray Wyatt are on it. So you can have one and you can have the other, but you may not be able to have both. It's the same thing. Hey, when Sinclair bought Ring of Honor, the Ring of Honor, the the ones that had been there since 2002 or whatever, that just thought that it was just the greatest era of Ring of Honor in the world when they were doing, you know, 14 matches in a rec center in front of 300 people and selling DVDs and all the guys were doing. Jack Evans was a fucking star. They longed for those days. But Kerry Silken longed for the days when he had the money before those days happened. Because it cost him a lot. Because there ain't a lot of people's going to watch that shit. And then they got real dedicated athletes that looked like some ass kickers, even if they still weren't fucking huge, and adopted a more serious style and got sold and got on television. And then they let these fucking goofs and their mass hysteria fucking hijack their company for two years and then leave them high and dry when they went to bilk the billionaire. But the point is, there's always... The original Ring of Honor audience hated it that we would bring in actual grown adult men and mainstream stars to teach their darlings not how to work, but how timing and fucking how to emote. And then uh, it, it, the same thing is going to happen with the AEW fans that want to see JoJo the dog-faced boy and the legless wonder, and all of a sudden... Real stars come in, and there's a level of professionalism that those guys that they've loved before can't measure up to, and they're going to get pissed about it. But it, the problem is, with all the little sub-factions of the fans of sub-genres of wrestling these days, not one of those genres has enough fans to keep any company in fucking flo floating on its own. You've got to have everybody. So when you get these independent shows that they either cater to the real independent fans or there's the deathmatch fans or there's the goofy inner gender fans or there's all these little niche products, we ain't drawing 12,000 people in St. Louis anymore. Wonder why. Here's why. Because it's all fucking funny and stupid and fake. And you can't believe in these people. <sighs> Closing thoughts, my boy. Well, those were blistering comments. And that's what happens when you hit the wrong button. <laughs> no other closing thoughts bad go home show to the pay-per-view in my eyes. Maybe they see Rampage as being the go home show. I don't know, but. I did not think this made people it didn't make me want to see any of the matches really at the pay-per-view other than punk because I'm curious, didn't make me want to see the big show in QT, certainly didn't make me want to see Jericho and MJF. Well, wait a Hold on, so what, before we go off the air, what are the matches? Do you have the card there? What has been set up? What are we going to have to suffer through this weekend? Give me one second, I'll pull it up. Well, and we'll make sure that everybody's apprised. As a, as a, as a gesture of goodwill toward AEW, we won't even charge them for the commercial time. We will promote their pay-per-view for them since they can't figure out how to do it themselves. All right, here are the matches listed here on Wikipedia. The best friends being Orange Cassidy, Chuck Taylor, and Wheeler Yuta. Oh, and the Jurassic Express. What? Versus the Hardy family office comprised of Matt oh, Hardy, God. Private Party, and the Hybrid 2 in a 10-man tag team match. So that's why they, it, they actually did an angle to promote a 10-man tag team match involving fucking job talent that nobody gives a shit about, and that's why they did all that on their television. Good Lord. Just have, if you're going to have a 10-man tag, just have the fucking tag. Why would you have a 10-man tag as an opening match anyway? What happened to, 
Just let's get the, give people time to get their Coke and popcorn and get them in their seats. Now we got a 10-man tag to open so that they'll do everything in this match to leave nothing for the people that the fans actually paid to come see. Okay, continuing on. Continuing on with the all-out pay-per-view extravaganza, we have a 21-woman Casino Battle Royal for the AEW Women's World Championship. The women in this Battle Royal include Nyla Rose, Thunder Rosa, The Bunny, Big Swole, Julia Hart, Ty Conti, Diamante, Penelope Ford, Red Velvet, Hikaru Shida, Emmy Sakura, Oh boy! Jade Cargill, Kira Hogan, Abaddon, Layla Hirsch, Kylan King, Rebel, Jamie Hayter, Anna J, Riho, and one woman to be determined. Good Lord. Okay, well, this is going to take, this is going to be a four hour show. So, right there's 20 or 30 minutes we'll be able to save. Uh, and I understand this was supposed to be on the pre show, but the, the pack can't get back in the country. So, they bumped this up to the main show. So, because of pack not being able to get into the country, they've sabotaged their pay per view. The next match listed a singles match John Moxley, the wild thing, versus Satoshi Kojima. <laughs> okay brian you're a japanese expert is satoshi kojima anybody that anybody gives a fuck about anymore even the fans of japanese wrestling there are new japan fans that give a fuck about him but in america by and large he's not any he's not a japanese wrestler that most wrestling fans would know his his name his picture is not on large billboards or the side of buildings and downtown spaces or anything like that if you yelled kojima at the mall a lot of people probably wouldn't get all fired up. No, and that's the same example you used the last time. And I think if you yelled Kojima at a mall, people would be confused. Why is this guy yelling then? The other guy yelled Tanahashi over there. Yeah, that's true. Well, there you go. They'd probably be looking at you because you were yelling rather than looking around to see where Tanahashi or Kojima were. Next match. When you're a big man, you don't need to yell, Jim. You can walk tall. Paul White versus QT Marshall with Aaron Solo and Nick Camarado. Okay, I believe we've already discussed that one. In a match, the world has been waiting to end. Chris Jericho versus MJF. And we've discussed that one. For the TNT Championship, Miro defends against Eddie Kingston. Oh, wait a minute now. Is this is this in order? The matches, the way that they're advertised in order? Well, to be they're fair... They're advertising Miro and Kingston on top of Jericho and MJF? I don't think they've actually announced the order of matches just yet. So we don't know for sure. What are you reading? I'm reading this off okay. Wikipedia, so I don't... Off we, oh, okay. Yeah, this is not... Unless Tony put it in himself, which you never know. Well, Miro and Kingston may not be too bad, because... You know, if Miro's going to be a monster and Kingston's got a bit of a clue, um, we'll see how that, that works out. We can't just haul off and puke on it right away. In a steel cage match for the AEW World Tag Team Championship, the champions, the Young Bucks, with Brandon Cutler, versus the Lucha Brothers with Alex Abrahantes. Uh, now we can go ahead and puke. We'll puke all over that one. The only thing that could make the Young Bucks wor versus Lucha Brothers worse would be to put it in a steel cage. So they'll do all kinds of goofy shit off the cage also. So this one is going to be a stinker. Am I the only one with my fingers crossed hoping for a scaffold match next? Maybe. Actually, no. I'll cross my fingers with that. If, de <laughs> it depends on... <laughs> If we can get the same guy to make the scaffold that makes their ring, maybe we'll, we'll lose one or two of these fucking guys. We won't have to look at them anymore. For the AEW Women's World Championship, Dr. Britt Baker, DMD, with Rebel, versus Chris Statlander. Boy, this will be the ultimate test of how good the surgeons have all put Britt Baker back together if she can manage to go through an entire match with Chris Flatlander and not get hurt. And it's come to this that, I guess it has come to this, that that's the best opponent that Britt Baker has for pay-per-view in this company right now. 
I personally, and I don't have a big problem with Statlander like you do, but I would have put Britt Baker in there with someone who could really work and have a hot match in Chicago, like a Thunder Rosa. But anyway. Yeah. CM Punk, the big return versus Darby Allen. Well, and we've talked about this. I think, obviously, I hope they don't gimmick it up with heels running in that st- just because they're they're going to want to give sting something to do and sting and punk should have no interaction because sting's a baby face and punk's a baby face and there should be no reason and uh, Dar- darby's a baby face there should be no reason that sting should have to stand up to cm punk on anything he's doing to darby if they I can see Tony Khan going, oh, Sting has to have a reason to go out there and run a bunch of heels out to clutter up ringside so he can fight them. I hope that Punk and Darby Allin have a good singles match between the two of them, and Punk brings Darby Allin's game up in that match and then hits him with go to sleep, one, two, three, and then shakes his hand and shakes hands with Sting. That will that will make Darby Allen look better afterwards, and obviously Punk cannot, under any circumstances, get beat by Darby. Well, I guess he could, but in any circumstances, in a sane world, he can't lose, whether fair or foul. His first match before he's got all these dream matches lined up, he can make Darby Allen look better by hanging and being competitive with him and beating him in the end because he's got to move on to main event guys and Darby's not there yet. Uh, Sting should not have anything to do with this and they don't need to clutter it up. As I said, with heels running around ringside so that they have a common enemy or something to bring them together or give Sting something to do. This is about CM Punk and the money riding on this and him looking as good as possible just coming in and not having any foolishness go on is worth a lot more than oh we got to give so and so something to do he's here tonight and we don't want his feelings to be hurt so that's my thoughts on that the main event for oh the- god we're not there yet wait a minute one two three four five six seven eight nine ten matches and in my eyes, a somewhat weak card, but the main event for the AEW World Heavyweight Championship, or at least just World Championship, I don't know if heavyweight's involved, Kenny Omega versus Christian Cage. Well, good luck to you, Christian, because this will, it'll be overbooked, it'll be an uh, overdone finish, it'll be uh, lots of gratuitous elite type of stuff and the the run-ins are getting out of control the run-ins are going to happen cage is going to try to have a serious match and twinkle toes is going to even if he's trying to be serious with his awkward gesticulations and movements and faces is going to make this an off-putting visual and it's going to be followed up by some kind of overdone overbooked finish that's my prediction We'll see what happens. And that's all out this Sunday from Chicago. Is that all of all out? I believe so. You never know. They'll be surprised. A lot of people think Daniel Bryan or Brian Danielson will be there or possibly Adam Cole or possibly other wrestlers begging for work. We don't know. Brian Danielson needs to come out at that tennis stadium in front of all those people on television. If they bring him out at a pay-per-view... That's, and that's another, that's this kind of shit that Mark Booker's do. Shitstain used to do that all the time. He would do an angle for something on a pay-per-view and blow it off on free television. Which is the exact opposite of what you're supposed to fucking do. The pay-per-view audience is the smallest. The free television audience is the largest. You get them hooked with the angle in front of your big audience, and then you either blow it off or continue it, when they have to pay, not the other way around. But a lot of people can't get that either. Anyway, we shall see. We'll cover this on the next episode of the drive through which will be in just a few days from now, as we've mentioned earlier in the program. Closing thoughts or just saying good night, Brian. Good night, Brian. We will see you on the drive through And good night, Gracie. I'll see you on Burns and Allen. And uh, for everybody else, Thank you guys for being a part of the show today. Uh, Hopefully, jimcornette.com is still working as we speak. 
and we'll see you on the drive-thru. Thank you. Fuck you. Bye-bye, everybody.